everyone. We're going to get started here in a moment. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Uh, to those of you in the room, and I believe we have some colleagues online as well. Uh, welcome to our uh, fifth TCP Universal meeting. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Amanda Wilson. I'm the Director General of the Office of Energy Research and Development at Natural Resources Canada, but I'm here today in my capacity as uh, Chair of uh, the CERT. So it is my pleasure to be here and I'm so happy to see so many of you in person and hope to get a chance to catch up uh, during the coffee breaks. Uh, it's been a while, I think, since we've all been in the same room together with CERT delegates and uh, TCPs. Um, I'm really looking forward uh, to today and to tomorrow. I think that we have a really fantastic um, agenda planned and I hope that you're able to make a lot of connections uh, while you're here as well. Um, it's also a pleasure to have my, uh, to have my co-chair here today, uh, Timur Gul. Uh, so those of you who don't know Timur, uh, he heads up the Energy Technology Policy Division uh, here at the IEA, and he was recently appointed as the IEA's Chief Energy Technology Officer. So this is a new position, and I think it's one that uh, speaks to the priority that the IEA has been placing uh, on energy technology and innovation in the context of uh, its broader ministerial mandates and, and work to uh, achieve net zero. So congratulations again, Timur, on the appointment. Um, I'm going to hand things over to Timur uh, shortly to help set the stage, but before I do that, um, I wanted to take an opportunity to recap for all of you some of the discussions that we had at CERT yesterday uh, related to our review of CERT, the working parties, and TCP alignment, um, alignment with overall government priorities, um, and overall uh, operational efficiencies. So I know that uh, most, if not all of you, I hope are familiar with this process. Uh, it started more than a year ago as part of the IEA's medium term strategy on energy technology and research. Uh, and, you know, given that uh, this is the 50th anniversary of uh, the IEA, of the CERT uh, and the broader structure. So that's half a century. We figured it was time to uh, maybe have a look at how we were structured and make sure that we were still um, organized in a way that, that made the most sense and could deliver the most value for governments around the world. Uh, so the self-assessment uh, that CERT started to undertake had two main lines of inquiry. So the first was how well uh, does CERT, its working parties and TCPs align with government priorities? And the second was what challenges exist with respect to operational efficiency of the working parties and TCPs and how can they be addressed? So in terms of process, uh, the review has been led by a CERT task force, uh, many of the members uh, you will see here uh, today. Um, but I have to say the IEA secretariat, pair and colleagues uh, provided strong support. I know that many of you have um, spoken to pair directly uh, and these interviews uh, that have been conducted have been supplemented by uh, information gathered through workshops and through other uh, forms of consultation. So the approach that we're taking to, to uh, the implementation uh, is a phased one. So we're cognizant that we don't wanna do too much too fast and we wanna make sure that we're able to do uh, the thinking and undertake the discussions that are needed to address the challenges um, that have come to the fore as we've uh, conducted this work. So yesterday at the CERT, we made a number of decisions that we will believe help to move things along in the right direction. Um, and we know that there's more to come. Uh, we'll be advancing the work in the coming months uh, with a view to bringing additional recommendations uh, for decision uh, at our next two CERT meetings. So that's the meeting that's scheduled for March and the meeting that's scheduled for June of next year. Uh, the starting point for these discussions is right here uh, with all of you over the next couple of days. Uh, we're very much counting on you to share your thoughts and your ideas for how we can continue to strengthen uh, this community. Um, before we jump into today's to, blah, sorry, <laughs> before we jump into today's agenda, uh, let me recap some of the decisions that we took yesterday at the CERT. Um, so, in the first category around. Uh, how to ensure greater alignment with government priorities and resources. Uh, there are six items that I wanna highlight very quickly. So uh, the first item is uh, the adoption of new guidelines around what it means to be a CERT working party, uh, clearly outlining expected function within the broader uh, governance structure. 
uh, in essence, uh, cert working parties uh, should not only oversee TCPs, uh, but they should also facilitate policy dialogue and cooperation among IEA members. Uh, in addition, they should provide strategic guidance to the IEA sec secretariat on sectoral and technology analyses and offer TCPs a platform to exchange information and communicate their efforts. Uh, the second uh, CERT decision was to expand the mandate uh, of the Renewable Energy Working Party to include the flexibility and resilience of energy systems and to change the reporting of three TCPs to now fall under uh, the ROOP. Third, uh, there was agreement to continue discussions regarding the next steps for both the end use working party and the working party on fossil energy. Uh, understanding that as they're currently comprised, uh, there may be some difficulty uh, in fulfilling the expectations of new working party guidelines. Uh, I know that many of you will have thoughts and suggestions around this, and I know that the task force and the secretariat will be keen uh, to get your input as we uh, continue to gather input uh, to make a recommendation to seek a cert decision by next June. Uh, fourth item, uh, CERT decided to formalize the concepts of TCP coordination groups and thematic discussions uh, in order to enable collaboration in areas that directly respond to government's policies and research needs. Uh, fifth, we're introducing clearer criteria for TCP requests for extension uh, to help ensure that uh, work is aligned with government priorities and that TCPs are sufficiently resourced uh, to deliver on outputs. Uh, and finally, uh, CERT is encouraging member governments to place more focused attention and strengthened organization around TCP coordination at the national level. Um, so that's the first category of items. In the second category, with respect to operational efficiency, uh, there's four things that I will touch on quickly. Uh, first, in approving the principles, uh, the guiding principles that I referred to, CERT codified the concept of TCP coordination groups. Uh, thus providing an additional mechanism through which TCPs can collaborate uh, with one another and with the IEA Secretariat. Uh, second, in order to ensure quality input to the TCPs as part of the request for extension process, uh, we've decided to review timelines, including by introducing uh, midterm reviews and offering peer review groups. Third, uh, we've agreed to elevate activities to strengthen joint efforts on communication and we'll seek a decision by the March CERT meeting on what governments, TCPs, uh, and the IEA Secretariat can do further in this area. And finally, uh, the CERT has decided to initiate dialogue with the SLT on collaboration, uh, including with respect to uh, working parties and TCPs. So I know that this sounds like a lot, and it is a lot uh, to take in all at once, especially when I'm just uh, reading these at you, um, but I hope you will have time uh, to, to think about them and consider them uh, over the coming days. Um, and we want your thoughts, we want your questions, we want your ideas uh, as we move forward. Uh, this next two days provide us with a really great starting point for that, and I know that I'm looking forward to the discussion, and I know my CERC colleagues are, as well as uh, IEA Secretariat members. I'm going to stop here. I'm going to hand the floor over to Timur, and he is going to uh, set the stage and tell us about what we can expect over the next uh, couple of days. So, Timur, over to you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Amanda, and um, good morning from my end as well. Uh, we haven't been in person since um, the pandemic broke out, so it's really great to see you all in person. Um, I know that uh, virtual meetings can sub, uh, substitute many things, but um, I, I have I see a very very big value in personal exchange um, uh, for all the obvious reasons. Uh, exchanging ideas is easier, um, bringing them forward is easier, and just building the community uh, is is part of the objective here. Uh, really, very much looking forward to co-chairing the meeting with you today, uh, Amanda. This fifth um, TCP Universal meeting. She already Amanda already touched on two important backdrops for um, for this uh, meeting today. One is um, the IA ministerial meeting taking place on 13th and 14th of uh, February, which will mark the 50th years, 50 years anniversary of um, the IEA since it was founded in 1974. And of course, the um, third review that um, she already um, uh, touched upon. We look very much look forward to discussing these matters with you over the course of today and tomorrow. Now, before looking ahead, let's take a short moment um, to remind ourselves where we're coming from, a couple of things from the past. You know, so I'm a big uh, fan of, you know, when I do scenario analysis in my 
in my professional life. You know? So as part of scenario analysis, it's sometimes very instructive to think about you know, what happened in the past couple of decades or so. So forgive me for this kind of, I'm not a historian, but forgive me for this type of um, a brief look at um, the past. Um, it's, but it's helpful to understand the DNA, you not know, the DNA of who we are as the IA secretariat, who the TCP network uh, is as uh, such. Um, the IA was set up, as you know, by its founding members to prevent oil sh uh, shortage and price increases. But, and I quote here, um, the significant uh, role energy R&D, uh, including intensified international cooperation, was uh, or already acknowledged in the early discussions to play a critical role in helping to solve the energy problems um, of uh, the time. The top priority in 1974 was, of course, to secure um, sustainable supplies of oil, um, the original signatory um, Governments also agreed, though, to explore cooperation on alternative sources of energy and energy con uh, conservation measures. Um, soon afterwards, in 1974, the government, uh, governing board uh, organized a special meeting on energy R&D in which members were for the first time represented by their respective R&D principles, um, the beginning of what became, becomes the first constellation of today's uh, Committee on Energy Research and Technology, the third shortly thereafter. Um, the priority uh, cooperative programs at the beginning, um, uh, at the time, were coal, solar, radioactive waste management, fusion, hydrogen, nuclear safety, waste heat utilization, conservation of energy and energy systems uh, analysis. So a uh, lot of things that we are still um, um, thinking through today as part of the TCPs, but um, uh, of course there has been a strong evolution uh, ever uh, since. Uh, a few of those uh, exist, uh, to, uh, TCPs from back in the days um, still exist, um, but since then many have been started and others have been closed down depending on um, the evolution of government priorities. My colleagues tell me that since the first TCP was created, we had um, over 80, in fact they say 82, but it's put here in brackets, so it seems like there's a slight uncertainty about the exact number um, over the years. And uh, looking back at some of these uh, historical uh, documents, and uh, Pierre and the colleagues have done that, tell you a very fascinating story about IEA's energy technology network. Why am I saying all this is because to me, I mean, the, this is a landscape that is very quickly involving uh, international collaboration, technology, R&D, all these kind of matters. But this strong and long, long standing foundation uh, is a, of the TCP network to me is a key strategic advantage compared with other frameworks that are out there to foster international collaboration on technology, R&D, &D, stability, institutional setup, the brand, country buy-in and backing, all these to my mind, are very important assets that um, the TCP uh, community has. Uh, today, there are 39 individual uh, technology collaboration programs with representatives from 55 different countries, 300 institutions, and thousands of experts. So um, uh, very much a proof of uh, today's um, important outreach. But with any uh, institution and with any organizational structure, it is important to take a closer look from time to time and reflect on how things are going, uh, whether it's still fulfilling its purpose, um, uh, what we can do in uh, order to improve um, the um, operations. This is what we have done in the um, CERT review. To my mind, this was a very important exercise, and I'm really grateful for the CERT uh, uh, cabinet as well as the committee for asking us to undertake it. Uh, if we don't critically uh, reflect on ourselves from time to time, it's like uh, in uh, private life as in uh, professional life, then we risk um, to become uh, less effective, potentially even um, obsolete. Um, but um, more importantly here also, we uh, may also fail to achieve the greater purpose of uh, international uh, collaboration in supporting governments to achieve their long-term uh, energy-related um, objectives. It is important to keep in mind, uh, I think, that today's um, objectives of governments um, are different. They have changed over time compared to the founding days in the 1970s or even, uh, as Amanda said, um, just uh, 10 years ago. This is also captured in how the IA ministerial mandates have changed from the 1970s to today. If I quote the 2022 ministerial communique, is I think very instructive, two relevant mandates um, that are important here also for our discussion today. Um, uh, first one is, in addition to ensuring global energy security, the IA has a new guiding principle supporting countries in the global effort to attain net zero greenhouse gas emissions in the energy sector by mid-century. This is the first mandate um, to bring to your attention. The other one is, we affirm the critical roles of technology, innovation and investment in enabling global net zero ambition. And we reaffirm the critical role of the IEA, including its technology collaboration program in addressing barriers to development, uptake and accelerated deployment of safe and sustainable 
clean energy technologies. From our end, um, we have done a lot um, in my in my personal perspective, and um, I'm saying this um, uh, as the head of the ATP division here in many ways, we have done a lot to push the agenda um, of international collaboration on technology innovation um, over the last couple of uh, years. Um, just to say an um, important angle here is, uh, and I, I can't uh, click anymore, I don't know why. No. Um, but uh, I think it's more important to know that the meeting is being live streamed. I think it's not much sense. <laughs> okay, now we're there. Um, so we have tried to push the analytical angle here very much. Um, uh, you may know um, from uh, Energy Technology Perspectives 2020 and the Net Zero Roadmap in 2021 that our assessment at the time was that almost half of the emission savings to reach net zero emissions by 2050 would need to come from technologies that are, were at the time of writing back then not yet commercially uh, available. This has changed this year. We just recently released our updated net zero by 2050 scenario and the change is on the back of significant innovation technology progress, the share uh, of technologies that um, uh, are not yet commercially available um, at scale in the market has fallen from almost half to in our two years ago assessment to 35% this year, building on the tracking work that we are doing in collaboration with you um, in the context of the ETP Clean Energy Technology Guide. I know this analysis um, may sound a bit theoretical at times. Well, I'm not, uh, um, I, I know you're working on very um, specific um, topics, very much um, focused on um, uh, uh, RD&D matters, etc. But believe me when I say, and I've been with the IA 15 years, I started in fact uh, 20 years ago for the first time back then in the renewable energy unit, and then 15 years ago, starting with the World Energy Outlook. Um, believe me when I say that this assessment has been truly invaluable to raise the profile of um, innovation and of te technology across all stakeholders. If you talk to Mission Innovation, Clean Energy Ministerial, to governments, whoever, uh, it was a very important um, uh, finding from uh, our analytical work supported by um, the collaboration with you that has helped raise the profile of uh, technology innovation to highest level of government. Uh, another area that I just wanted to highlight uh, very briefly that we've also highlighted in our work is the uh, point on international collaboration. This is sometimes hard to pin down, you know, the value of international collaboration. I think you all value it, but if you were asked, like, uh, what is the number you can give me to the value, then you may probably um, struggle to do that because it's sometimes a bit in, uh, intangible, you know, the value that comes with um, with uh, collaboration and then specifically in uh, areas like technology rd and we have made an effort in um, our special report on clean energy innovation and in the energy technology perspective series back in 2020 where we found some very good historical evidence of the value of international collaboration on technology rd and um, but um, we made analysis here building on um, our assessment and understanding of technologies and sectors um, in the net zero roadmap um, two years ago where we showed that um, without uh, international cooperation, um, uh, uh, you can you cannot reach net zero by 2050 um, uh, in, in any kind of realistic type of setup. Again, um, might sound theoretical um, uh, for um, uh, from some of your perspectives, but again, believe me, for the purpose of international collaboration and promoting it um, for many, many governments, uh, highest level stakeholders, this was a truly important findings. Now, we have uh, a lot of ideas um, of what we can do to strengthen our collaboration, and we will turn this to this in the next uh, session. But before doing this, let me just recognize a couple of steps that we have taken <clears throat> in recent years. Um, the first one is, of course, uh, the TCP Universal Meetings, which um, uh, was one of the first decisions of our executive director when he was first appointed in uh, 2015 as a way to bring the TCPs together in a more coordinated way under the IEA. We also decided to rebend the implementing agreements to the IEA technology programs uh, to uh, strengthen the branding. And I think personally from where I'm coming from, this has been a very big success. Um, one of the first things I did when I was appointed as the head of the Energy Technology Policy Division five years ago, and I see um, Paul Oke smiling right away, was to ask him, um, the chair of the Hydrogen TCPs, to be seconded to the Secretariat um, to help us with the analysis in the context of the Future of Hydrogen rep uh, report that we've been asked by uh, the Japanese G20 presidency to bring to the attention of um, G20 governments. Thank you, Paul, very much, and um, your employer, of course, <laughs> for um, allowing us to have you in the Secretariat at the time um, for several months working on this report. Um, it was very 
very, very useful for us. Well, through him, we had a lot of expertise on the one hand, but we also had access um, to a hydrogen uh, network that um, uh, is within the context of um, the TCPs. And um, we um, are open, very much open, um, to make this available for future IA publications as well. Um, we've tried in the past, after Paul left us, to um, discuss with a couple of TCPs um, to um, put in place a similar um, uh, yeah, uh, configuration, but unfortunately we are without success, but the door remains open here as an encouragement to all of you, of course. Um, uh, second, uh, or um, third, actually, uh, I would also like to highlight the collaboration with many of the TCPs on the development and update of our um, ETP Clean Energy Technology Guide um, is an online tool that highlights uh, 550 technologies um, uh, that could help the, uh, put the world on track to reach net uh, zero emissions. We always talk about you, the TCPs, um, as the world's technology expert. And for me, to my mind, this is where it shows in, this, in the context of the clean tech um, guide. The knowledge that you have in these key technology areas is very critical. And we are receiving a lot, a lot of requests on this particular clean energy technology guide. Um, it's been shown to be truly invaluable um, for many stakeholders out there. Governments want is one, but um, very much industries um, as well. Um, fourth, uh, I want to thank the TCPs that were involved in the development of the technology and innovation pathways for zero carbon ready buildings by uh, 2030 is a bit long title, I recognize that, but it's been a great report. Um, I believe uh, we all learned a lot from this project and how we can facilitate TCP IA secretariat collaboration um, in uh, areas of priority to our member governments. It has inspired, in fact, as part of the third review, um, reforming the TCP coordination groups um, from static platforms to more dynamic and output oriented collaborations. So we hope this is just the beginning of um, more this type of collaborations. Fifth, we have benefited greatly from the collaboration with the ETSAP TCP. I uh, would like to um, thank Brian here, uh, who's with us today. Um, part of our global energy climate model is, of course, based on the times meddling um, framework developed by ETSAP, but we have also had the pleasure of having Brian here, um, uh, the ETSAP chair, with us for a few weeks uh, last year to collaborate uh, on the topic of energy modeling and go critically through what we are doing, why we are doing it, how we are doing it, etc. So really big thanks um, to you, Brian, for all your expertise there. And as a last example, of course, this is something more regular, it's a bit less um, obvious to pin down, but we benefit a lot from TCP delegates that contribute over the years to IA reports with valuable material, peer reviews, etc. It really helps us to ensure quality of our work. This brings me to the future. Uh, we will discuss in uh, session two the 50 years anniversary next year, and I believe it will give us a um, unique um, opportunity um, to tell the history of 50 years of technology development and the role of TCPs. Um, in the context of the ministerial, we will host a um, special edition of our biennial ministerial meeting at which we gather representatives of um, all family, uh, IA family countries at ministerial level to stake, take stock of global energy cooperation and take decisions for the coming years um, of, uh, for, um, uh, for the IEA. Um, the, uh, Given that it's the 50th anniversary, um, the February meeting next year will be bigger, uh, reflecting on what's been achieved, what we can do better uh, moving forward um, uh, with a strong um, record on technology collaboration over the last um, 50 years. Uh, innovation will be an important topic. There will be a full day uh, energy innovation um, uh, forum. I think I went to this slide a little earlier. I just realized. Anyway. Um, do it anyway. Um, um, this innovation forum is a unique opportunity, if you ask me. It's been requested by G7 leaders for the IA to host. Um, we, are, we have convinced uh, or discussed very carefully with the uh, ministerial bureau to have it back to back with um, the um, ministerial meeting. Um, and uh, I do think it's a unique opportunity. We will gather um, uh, startups, we will gather, uh, gather um, people from the investment communities, governments, etc., to discuss um, with your input um, what we can do to improve um, uh, uh, the pace at which technologies, new ideas get into the market in different areas, what could happen in emerging economies and elsewhere, uh, and what the IEA should be doing over the next couple of years, what to prioritize in the innovation um, uh, space. So um, we will come back to this item in session two to gather your input, how we can strong, send a strong uh, 
um, message to the ministerial meeting and the Energy Innovation Forum. But um, I hope that um, this will mark not only a reflection of what's happened over the last 50 years, but also um, uh, a good boost to what we should be doing as the Secretariat, but also in the context of um, the uh, TCPs moving forward. Now I come to this slide, which are the objectives of the universal meeting. Um, first of all, there's a uh, value, of course, in coming together. I said that in the beginning, um, to think about what's working well, what's not working so well, setting the direction for the next years of collaboration um, with the ministerial meeting, of course, as an important uh, milestone. Um, we will uh, be starting, the, the meeting will be a starting point um, for how we can fo take forward the results of the CERT review um, to the next CERT meeting, including the three points that you he see here, improving joint efforts on communicating the work of the TCPs, kicking off discussions for the renewed TCP coordination groups, and upgrading uh, the, uh, of the request um, for uh, extension mechanism. And of course, it's a chance for all of us to get uh, get back together, get to know each other to the extent we don't um, do it uh, now, exchange ideas, um, compare what's going well in your TCP network compared to others and, you know, get new ideas on how to improve things. Um, so use the breaks, the reception uh, to get to know each other better is uh, one of our hopes of this uh, meeting today. The agenda, I hope you um, all have uh, received it. I don't want to go through it in, uh, into great detail. Just to say this morning, we will spend some time sharing the successes and stories that have defined the NCP network um, over the uh, past five decades. But we also want to look ahead and discuss what comes next. Um, after lunch, we will focus on activities to um, improve our um, communication. Uh, we will start in uh, plenary, but then di be divided into uh, breakout groups. There will be more information uh, coming after uh, lunch. At the end of the day, uh, you see it on the bottom left-hand side here, very humbly so, but it's a reception. So um, hopefully you can all um, join us at the IEA Cafe uh, just over here. We will start tomorrow morning at um, 9.30. Um, with the first discussion on the renewed TCP coordination groups. My colleague uh, Per Anders uh, will introduce the concept then and we'll, uh, we will hear from uh, both the TCPs and the Secretariat on a first list of uh, proposals. Um, before discussing these proposals in a more interactive format, the IEA Executive Director will join us, um, Fatih Biro, to provide special um, remarks. He would have liked to be here today, but um, there was the World Energy Outlook launch yesterday. Uh, he is um, in uh, Brussels today for very important meetings um, to launch the report there, but also um, with uh, NATO, so he couldn't uh, join us uh, today, but he will address the um, TCP Universal to meeting tomorrow. After lunch, there will be uh, the last session of the Universal meeting, uh, focusing on the revision of the request for extension, another decision from the third um, review. So very packed days. Um, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to approach us. Um, there are, of course, there's, of course, pair. Uh, there are Anna, um, Lotte, I don't see Charlotte right now, Mao, but um, they must, uh, of course, there's Charlotte, yes, She's exactly. <laughs> um, Mao is currently uh, upstairs. So um, we are all here to support you and make this uh, useful um, two days um, for all of you, but uh, also for all of us. And with that, um, thank you very much for listening. Thank you for coming and back to you, Amanda. Thanks so much, Timur. Definitely uh, helpful and interesting to see uh, some of the... Uh, some of the history of uh, the TCP network and uh, to see what the priorities were back in 1974 and 1975. Um, so we're gonna start our uh, first formal session of the day. Uh, it's going to focus on uh, the things that we need to consider when we're talking about the future of the TCP network um, and how collaboration can be further uh, improved. I'm going to hand uh, the uh, mic over to my colleague and one of my uh, vice chairs, uh, Toshi Sakamoto from uh, Japan, to speak from a Japanese point of view on the current activities of TCPs and how they match uh, his country's uh, policy and research priorities. So Toshi, over to you. Thank you, Amanda. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, let me start with a very brief self-introduction. About 20 years ago, I was the chair of executive committee of one of the TCPs called the CTI, Climate Technology Initiative, which was transferred to UNID many years ago. So it's among the uh, over 80 TCPs. Um, let me first underscore the importance of TCP networks. Uh, as, we, as, as you know, the energy issues are getting more and more complex. And as a result of that, we need to address a more cross-cutting 
and more cross-sectoral issues. Uh, to that end, I think TCP networks between TCPs, among TCPs, even with other international initiatives, are very important and could be valuable asset for IEA. And what are the elements of success for international collaboration? I would point out two points. One is alignment with government priorities. The other is overall operational effort, as uh, pointed out by Amanda in her opening remarks. And to that end, we are working on the third review. Um, the slide in front of you is the excerpt of G7 ministerial meeting um, this April, which was held in Sapporo, uh, Japan. So I will be talking about uh, G7 priority, not Japan's priorities. And of course, the G7 priorities are not necessarily identical to IEA member states' priorities, but I think it's still a good reference point. And also, uh, please note that uh, I took liberty of dropping some paragraphs, uh, which I thought are not so relevant to our discussion. For example, paragraph on gas market and a paragraph on finance, uh, I dropped those paragraphs in this slide. Uh, let me start with uh, the most recent and excellent alignment with government uh, priorities. That is paragraph 76 and 77, industrial decarbonization. As you may know, last year, a G7 presidency of Germany uh, successfully put forward an industrial decarbonization agenda, which was succeeded by Japan this year. And we agreed upon uh, for example, a global data collection framework in steel industry. So um, and the, the, this initiative among G7 has led to the creation of working party of industrial decarbonization, WPID, within CTI communities. So I think that is the most recent and successful example of alignment with government priorities. Of course, uh, there are many other areas we are well aligned with government priorities. Uh, paragraph 6.3, energy efficiency, uh, 6.4, or renewables, 66, uh, power systems. Uh, we are doing a lot of work uh, within TCP uh, communities. And also paragraph 78 to 82, uh, I think uh, uh, we are uh, somehow, uh, to some extent, uh, were aligned to the government priorities. But what about uh, 61 methane? Um, in this paragraph, G7 pointed out, ministers pointed out the need to develop uh, MRV, measurement, reporting, and the verifications. And paragraph 65, clean energy supply chain. Uh, this is a new cross-cutting issues we may have to consider how to contribute to it. Uh, 67, hydrogen. Of course, we have a hydrogen TCPs, uh, but it is placed under renewable working party. Um, that gives me the impression that the TCP hydrogen, hydrogen TCP is focusing on green hydrogen. Um, but the G7 ministers agreed, the blue or green, colors doesn't matter. What does matter is uh, carbon intensity. And also they pointed out the importance of derivatives such as ammonia. So uh, maybe we may have to make a bit more effort to align on the hydrogen, uh, hydrogen uh, research and development. 68, carbon management uh, ministers um, listed a lot of issues to for, for research and development, such as CCUS, DAX and BEX, as synthetic fuels. Um, nuclear energy, number 70, um, ministers uh, pointed out the need to develop advanced nuclear technologies, such as SMR. Uh, we are doing uh, nothing about that. And nuclear fusion uh, was not mentioned at all in this communique. 
uh, 36 pages. And uh, Lisa's communique also did not mention uh, nuclear fusion. I spotted just one difference, one word, a fusion in science minister's communique. So it seems to me, uh, yesterday, uh, vice chair of FCCC informed us uh, there are 50 startups for nuclear fusion and raising $6 billion. Uh, therefore, I believe that we should make more effort so that the government recognize nuclear fusion as, near near, as energy rather than as science. And the critical mineral, um, this is obviously uh, one of the most important and uh, new issues uh, we need to consider. So these are the G7 um, priorities. Uh, I will stop here and uh, um, I hope uh, my brief presentation could be food for thought for today's discussion. Thank you. Thanks very much, Toshi. That was uh, very useful. Uh, we're now going to get a uh, perspective from another uh, government. Uh, we have with us uh, Peter Olson, uh, who is director uh, within the Australian Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water. Uh, Peter, thank you for traveling all of this way to join us here in person. We very much appreciate it. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to you so you can provide a uh, perspective on Australia's uh, priorities and other aspects that you find uh, that you think might be important for uh, this group to consider. Thanks. Thank you, Amanda. Um, hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here at my first TCP meeting. Um, so I'm the director of uh, the Net Zero Innovation section in the Department of Climate Change and Energy. And I've had the privilege to work across the international clean energy collaborative landscape for the last five years, um, particularly in the multilateral uh, areas. And I've seen a lot of growth in this multilateral collaboration, both on R&D, but also on policy to support clean energy. We're also seeing governments working more with industry and researchers together in this space. So it's been a really exciting couple of years. Um, my team is responsible for now leading our strategic engagement across the TCPs. So as this is my first meeting, I'm really looking forward to having a chat with everyone today to understand more about what you're all doing. But it's also been a really opportune time to come together with the CERT review and seeing how that uh, can play out and being able to think about how we can also um, participate in that as well. Quick context on Australian policies. Uh, so we have a target for 82% renewables in our grid by 2030. So this is supported by large investment in our grid infrastructure. And we've also launched a $2 billion um, hydrogen, large scale hydrogen project scheme. Um, and we're very focused on developing clean energy and the materials supply chains, uh, particularly increasing our own um, battery manufacturing capacity and solar capacity within Australia. But today my focus is on the TCPs. Uh, I just wanted to raise three areas that I see as important to the future success of the TCPs. From my experience across this multilateral policy ecosystem um, and also with some fresh eyes. So I've got three Cs that I'm working with today. The first is to be contemporary. With the World Energy Outlook just released yesterday and congratulations to the IEA on this. We can see that there's been a big change with the drastic uptakes of solar, EVs and heat pumps from the 2021 edition to this one. The IEA analysis has pointed out to the need of the tripling of renewables and the doubling of energy efficiency and that emphasis on grids and demand response measures and storage. So, like the WIO, our trajectory of research, innovation and technology needs to show this evolution from where we were just three years ago and also we've just heard about some of the prioritization that we need to take um, into account. We need to be smart with our efforts in these landscapes and the constant evolution in clean energy innovation. There's also the need um, in being contemporary to recognize how many other groups um, that are now working in this space. There's lots of collaboration out there and I can really see that there's opportunities that these other collaborative platforms are natural allies to the TCPs. The areas for you to work with, but also to disseminate your work, particularly into government and other policy organizations that work with them. So this leads me to my second point on coordination. So we've got great examples of TCPs working collaborative across the clean energy cooperative ecosystem. And I really think this is something that could continue to grow with TCPs and other initiatives. 
uh, finding opportunities to strengthen research plans and projects by partnering with other programs like Mission Innovation, the Clean Energy Ministerial, or regional groups like the International Solar Alliance. It should be a priority to help channel resources towards the solutions that we need. We've also just heard about the opportunity for better coordination across the TCPs. And I can really see how this is going to be really important uh, because also, unfortunately, governments have finite budgets to invest in R&D. So there's a real practical element to coordination and greater collaboration as it actually strengthens the business case for projects and for funding. And finally, communication. So it underpins how we can achieve the first two. So the better we can communicate what the TCPs are achieving and what they're planning to achieve and what governments would like them to achieve, the stronger our ability is for the TCPs to become contemporary and also better coordinated. So I'm really happy to see the discussion on the agenda for later today on how we can ensure improved communication in all directions. Um, and also to continue to champion and publicize the outcomes of TCPs to a broader audience. Least of all, because I can see that that's a chance to potentially attract new investment from industry or other donors. If they don't know about the great work that you're doing, how do they know that they, this is something they should get behind and be supporting? So really looking forward to hearing from everyone today um, and how we can make this agenda of transformation across the CERT and the TCPs a really great success. Um, and thank you for having me. Wonderful, thank you so much, uh, Peta. We really appreciate uh, your participation here uh, over the next couple of days. Uh, we're gonna turn now and get a TCP uh, perspective. Uh, I'm gonna turn it to David Shipworth, who is the chair of the users uh, TCP. I don't know which direction, there we go. <laughs> David, wonderful, nice to see you uh, to provide a few thoughts. All right, Over thank you. you very much. Um, so I'll provide a slightly different perspective. One thing, we're acutely aware of within the users TCP is two countervailing narrative arcs. One, when you step outside of the techno-economic energy sphere focused on hitting a normative goal of decarbonization and start looking at the literature from, in this case, the US National Intelligence Council, you look at what geopolitical strategists are looking at, you get a very different sense of what the world is going to look like over the next 30 years than what it has looked like over the last 30 years. So when you look at these documents, you see a lot of information about the world becoming more contested, particularly when it comes to the social and political side of things. So this slide basically looks at the difficulties that we will increasingly face in maintaining the democratic mandate to decarbonize. And that will apply both from international geopolitical interactions, but down to local debates over the social acceptability of net zero options. So I think there are some significant challenges ahead. I think that in order to address those challenges, we need to be acutely aware of the, the kind of inflection point we're at. We've spent a lot of time looking at technology development and driving down cost curves, but actually driving uptake and getting functional systems that operate starts to put a lot more emphasis onto the social acceptability and operation of these technologies, particularly in highly distributed energy systems. So I think we need a shift further towards looking at systems as well as the technologies, a shift towards deployment as well as technology development, looking at what is effective as well as what is efficient. And by effectiveness, it's really what can we get in the ground and operating quickly. A shift to resilience maximization, as well as cost minimization. Again, it's an area that I know the Secretariat is looking at, and there's been discussions with cross TCP platforms on that, but we need to do more in that direction. And looking at energy service and security, as well as energy supply security. So how do we protect people in a rapidly changing world? So I think from a TCP perspective, 
in order for this coordination to actually work so that we can start looking at these cross TCP collaboration structures, it would be helpful to think about aligning the timings and work practices of TCPs. I think there is a need to accelerate and become more agile in the way TCPs initiate tasks. We also have to have a smaller, more responsive and knowledgeable EXCO that really is thinking about how they translate the work of tasks through to council. So I think we need a range of transformations if these cross TCP platforms are going to exist. I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Uh, that's really... Uh... There's a lot of food for thought there uh, on that slide. So thank you very, very much. Uh, we're going to open it up uh, to the floor for comment. But before we do that, I'm going to turn to Timur and uh, see if you have some thoughts to offer. Yeah, thank you, Amanda. And um, thanks for these great um, interventions, both uh, Toshi, Peter, um, but was also David uh, really liked um, uh, the points that he just made. Um, I wanted to just briefly take the opportunity to share an initial list of potential activities that um, my colleagues put together that we believe uh, could be important to consider. One, on the one hand, to government officials, but also on the other hand, that's the second bucket um, to um, TCP representatives. So the first point is really uh, towards uh, governments or so certain working party delegates, um, our wish list um, for the overall coordination of um, the TCPs. First is um, we have heard very good things about TCP national days, wherever the, um, they exist. Um, so identifying a TCP national coordinator, wherever you don't have it, um, to organize TCP national days and disseminate the work of the TCPs is a very good um, starting point. Um, key questions to think through here are, um, does your participation in the TCPs align with your government's priorities um, or um, uh, are you still in TCPs because that used to be a priority or have you forgotten about joining in the TCP where your new priority actually exists? Um, is there a mess match, um, in other words, um, with um, those priorities and what the TCPs are working on? Um, also, how does your um, TCP participation align with your participation in other fora? Um, the SEM, uh, Clean Energy Ministerial, as well as Mission Innovation are a key fora here, of course, but um, there, there might be others. Um, the second point is uh, ensuring that delegates with relevant competence are nominated to IA working parties. Um, we have uh, recently established a new working party on industrial decarbonization, um, where we have made really good experience and because it's a new thing. You know, so we were able to reach out more concretely to um, governments on what is the purpose of that working party, what are we looking for, etc. Around 20 countries have nominated um, really excellent experts, I, I must say. Um, but of course, by the sheer number, uh, IEA has um, 29 member countries. You understand that there are still countries, a couple of countries missing. So we hope um, that those countries will follow up. But the key point here is about the competence um, that is put into the working parties. That is uh, a critical vehicle to, to actually help um, guide the TCPs and, uh, um, and uh, work together with them. As for support to our analytical work, we um, greatly appreciate the help in making contacts within the governments um, for IEA events. Uh, peer reviews and uh, projects, peer uh, IA events, just to, you know, give a shout out here to Amanda for a big help she just did for a forthcoming workshop also, US uh, Vice Chair Dennis, you know, so this is extremely helpful um, for the CERT um, uh, and uh, the working parties helping us there. Um, uh, another example is we have uh, the Clean Energy Demonstration Project database that we have developed over the last um, two, three years uh, and following the um, $94 billion commitment that was made at the Clean Energy Ministerial in Pittsburgh, um, we are getting a lot of support and contacts um, to help us track these type of um, uh, commitments and that has been proven very useful and we'll need this help again uh, next year. Also, of course, uh, continuing to facilitate tracking and reporting of RD&D data and relevant uh, projects such as on technology classifications. And finally, uh, but very important to us, uh, financial support, of course, uh, to our energy technology analysis here at the IEA. Now, to what concerns the TCPs and what uh, they could be doing, my colleagues gave me um, a long list of uh, areas where um, they would like to strengthen our collaboration. This is a bit a list coming from the technology division. So. Um, also in view of what David just said, don't uh, take this as a, a comprehensive list because the IEA has um, many different divisions, many teams. Uh, I see um, 
our uh, uh, efficiency and inclusive trans transition office uh, represented over there by um, by Vida. You know, so there's a lot of activities uh, across the IA that we have a renewable energy division, the World Energy Outlook teams, and uh, various different um, others, of course. So everyone is going to be interested in something different from you, but everyone is going to be interested. I think that is the important part here. For what concerns my team, the technology team here, uh, we have identified um, two areas. One is uh, sector and technology focused, um, where there's great interest to collaborate more in areas like shipping and aviation, heat pumps, hydrogen, as well as industrial decarbonization. And when it comes to cross-cutting topics on carbon management, clean tech manufacturing and supply chains, as well as uh, critical uh, minerals. We are gathering all this information. I mentioned that already earlier in our ETP Clean Energy Technology Guide and whatever you can do to help us further improve this uh, would be extremely um, useful. Uh, last year or this year, actually, we tracked 550 technologies and components with specific mentions of technology readiness levels and major R&D and demonstration projects around the world. Um, this also informs our net zero by 2050 scenario. So it's a very important um, database here to understand the role of innovation and meeting energy and climate um, uh, goals. And as I said earlier, we're receiving a lot, a lot of uh, questions, feedback from all types of users in the world. So it's very important for us to keep this information accurate and um, up to date. Um, Finally, just to say, I believe the TCP coordination groups can be an important avenue for building and strengthening our strategic uh, collaboration. Of course, it's not the only way, but uh, we are very keen to uh, engage uh, closer with you. Um, it's very important for us in the process of uh, coming up with how we better also communicate our work. Um, and uh, there will be discussions this afternoon on, on this, of course. Um, so these are just a few ideas um, and the wish list that my colleagues uh, put in uh, in writing here to me so I don't make, that I don't miss out on mentioning it to all of you. So, um, of course, uh, looking forward to hearing both from the CERT delegates and the TCP representatives what's on your list. Thank you for listening. Thanks very much, Timur. So uh, with that excellent uh, wish list and with the three excellent uh, interventions that we've had already, we're going to open it up uh, for a broader uh, discussion. I have two questions sort of to kickstart uh, the discussion. So for CERT delegates uh, in the room, uh, we're interested in uh, what, uh, if you could tell us what your government's top uh, policy and research needs are at the moment. Um, and do they correspond uh, to uh, the scope of work that's currently happening across the working parties and TCPs? Um, and for TCPs uh, in the room, what would you like to see from CERT uh, in terms of guidance or improvements uh, in the way that the TCP uh, network operates? Give us your wish list. Um, so if you'd like to intervene, please uh, raise your flag, raise your nameplate, and um, we will uh, go around the room. Perfect. Okay, please. Oh. Sorry. Uh, Paul Lucas from the Hydrogen TCP. Um, thank you for this opportunity to exchange directly with the third delegate, because uh, I think it's the first time we have the opportunity to, 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 to exchange with you. And um, for example, I think there is sometimes some misunderstanding between the CERT and the TCPs. For example, uh, the Japanese delegate uh, said that a few minutes ago that uh, as we are in the renewable working party, we are working only on renewable, which is not exactly true. Since the beginning, we are working on the low carbon hydrogen. We are including, we have, since the beginning in 1977, we are work, we are tasked on the hydrogen from nuclear energy. We have tasked on uh, collaboration with uh, CCS. So it's a difficulty for us to belong to the renewable working party because we are not only renewable. And it's a very good uh, thing to exchange with you to, to clarify, for example, this, uh, this misunderstanding, because uh, maybe we, we need to have more exchange on the content of the TCP to, to, to know better what we are doing inside our TCP, for example. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, we're gonna go now to the wind uh, TCP, uh, Stefan. Yeah, thanks. We just had the EXCO meeting last week and uh, David, uh, how to start or accelerate starting a task. We're about a bit puzzling how to manage all the tasks. Uh, we have more than 20 tasks now in, in our TCP and um, looking at all the great ideas of having coordination groups and having TCP, TCP interaction. One big question mark from our side is how would that be resourced in a proper way that these uh, really move on 
because that is it's a burden already on all the the task members in our task. Um, so any additional activity uh, as handle that and manage that. That would be if we could get advice or best best practices um, that work properly already in other TCP or TCP 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 coordination. If Sirt has ideas how to do that, that would be very much appreciated. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to uh, continue the discussion, but I just wanted to mention, I should have done this at the start, that for those colleagues who are joining online, you can of course uh, use the raise your hand function uh, to indicate that you'd like to intervene, uh, or you can make a note in the comments. Thank you and apologies for missing that earlier. Uh, we're going to go now to the ETSAP uh, TCP. Uh, Brian, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, firstly, just to say it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, this is the fifth of these gatherings that I've attended, and um, I, I see some people around the table who've, who've, um, I suppose, old friends and, and new friends, and so it's 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 great to be here. Um, my suggestion for for cert it, it kind of builds on what what David showed, and it also builds on some of the work that's happening in the TCPs and in the IEA but it's maybe less visible than it might be. Uh, and this is a kind of a, I suppose, explicitly focusing on the societal dimensions of the energy transition. Um, I think um, the, the societal aspects are increasingly recognized as, as very important. The, the latest IPCC report, the AR6, for the first time in 40 years, had a chapter sort of focusing on the, the societal dimension of the energy transition. Increasingly, the TCPs themselves are more involved in the societal aspects of the energy transition. And you can see that in some of the evolution of the name changes over the years. I mean, the the, the energy in buildings has energy in buildings and communities, the, the users TCP, the name of that, the, the equality TCP. So I think we're, we're seeing it reflected uh, increasingly in the TCP's activity, but it's 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 maybe not being kind of and maybe a coordination group as a way to to focus on this, and, and the final point on this is it, it's very interesting. Just I was looking at the WIO twenty twenty three and comparing it with the WIO twenty twenty two, and when you look at the projected uh, European response to the restricted gas demand, um, two thirds of the response projected were on the supply side and a third on the demand side. Whereas it was very interesting to look at the graphic in yesterday's WIO, which showed that two thirds of the response actually happened at the demand side. So I think there's, there's, and I suppose David's presentation highlighted some of the challenges on the societal aspects of the energy transition, but I think there's also positive dimensions that can be brought out in, in mobilizing um, society around the energy transition. And there's, there's two parts to that, but but I think it's underexplored and uh, undervalued, and and yet it's 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 bubbling up in different ways, and maybe a, a focus on that would be something I'd suggest. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Uh, we'll go now to the gas and oil TCP, Justin. Thank you, Amanda. Um, I just uh, also would like to congratulate the organizers for uh, convening uh, this important meeting. Certainly very helpful. Uh, we're a big family and uh, there is a lot of, I think, uh, benefit for uh, getting inputs from uh, everyone. Uh, now, um, my comment was uh, purely in response to some of this dis discussion which has been involving on where does the hydrogen um, TCP belong. And I think that to me um, is an indication that there is an additional challenge on the horizontal level. I think as we th talk about coordination, we see an energy market getting more and more integrated. So when I look at the TCP structure, it seems, seems quite um, um, sort of silo-based. Um, I think probably uh, it's hard to get away from a fuel-based division, but um, I think more and more of the energy technology work will need to be working in the space of hybrid solutions. Um, and that also means that I think our work, we need to also embody a um, discussion on uh, how we can coordinate uh, cross-cut. Um, I think uh, that also speaks to our TCP. When we are rebranding, we see that there is a lot of uh, interlinkages from uh, sort of the flexibility point of view. Um, so. 
I just wanted to voice that. I think uh, perhaps there is a discussion there to um, think about in terms of uh, coordination. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justine. Uh, we're going to go now to the enhanced oil recovery uh, TCP, Cesar. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to say thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, first time Colombia is a city that's well here. And representing the enhanced oil recovery, we have been working as well to change our name, to change our objectives aligned with the net zero strategy and the trilemma. Today, we are energy optimization recovery as uh, we are coming from the Sotsurfa resources and align what Peta is saying and about net zero and Timur is saying. I think the TCPs has a lot of opportunities today to integrate related uh, with the lines of technology. Uh, we, we founded um, different integrations from hydrogen, from oil and gas, from Sotsurfas, from biological system. We need technology pathway. So if we strain our TCPs related to technology, as we have already different uh, technology roadmaps, I think will be a good opportunity to integrate uh, ourselves. And maybe uh, in the discussion we're going to have today, we will see how advanced fuel cells can be connected with combustion in situ and you are, how we can com uh, combine all technology, mature technologies with new brand technologies. And it's the matter of technology and innovation that we are all here today to solve our dilemma from the world. So energy security, decarbonization, energy transition is something that today all the TCPs are working on. And all related to carbon intensity, how we include technology with carbon intensity options, lowering emissions is something that put us together. And I think all the TCPs are working on that sense. So I think it's a, a good pathway to integrate technology readiness level, carbon intensity options, and how we can uh, elaborate the coordination groups related to the trilemma of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cesar. Uh, we're, we'll go now to the equality uh, TCP, uh, Zeta. Thank you, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here, um, and I wanted to second the uh, second the opinion of David and Brian. And uh, we also see an increasing demand for um, including gender and e equality in in the other TCPs, um, because we also believe that harnessing all the talents is quite important to actually. <laughs> Attention, attention. En raison d'un incident technique dans notre bâtiment, nous vous prions d'évacuer les locaux. Veuillez vous rendre aux portes de sortie de secours. Attention, attention. Because of a technical hitch in our building, we ask you to evacuate the premises. Please go okay. to the emergency exit. Everyone, please, please don't forget to bring your passes. Bring your passes. You can leave your stuff attention, here. Attention, attention. En raison d'un incident technique dans notre bâtiment, nous vous prions d'évacuer les locaux. Veuillez vous rendre aux portes.
energy and um, just as one one just one evidence is that um, there are around 22 to 25 percent of women um, working in energy and globally which is um, a really um, a, a sad number and we need to increase that to harness all the talents that we need um, so uh, we, uh, what we want to discuss today is that we, we can, as the Equality TCP, perhaps be involved in uh, providing guidelines on, or consultations uh, to other TCPs, if that is of interest, um, to making sure that um, we are not as one of the cross-cutting TCPs in the, I, in, in the IEA working in isolation, but uh, collaborating with you all together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Azira, and thank you for that offer. Uh, we will go now to the GHGTCP. Keith, over to you. Uh, thank you, Chair. <clears throat> and uh, I'd also like to uh, say that um, uh, I think these uh, meetings provide a very useful function. Um, <clears throat> like others, I'd like to give my support to uh, coordination uh, groups at the Greenhouse Gas R&D program. We focus on uh, carbon capture utilization and storage technologies and technologies for carbon dioxide reduction. Uh, so we, we're, we're quite cut, cross cutting. We come under the working party for fossil energy and we're also uh, uh, invited to attend renewable energy working party uh, meet, meetings. And uh, at the fossil uh, energy working party, we uh, provide updates and such like, but we, do have, um, I mean, our, our work program uh, cuts across uh, power systems, low carbon hydrogen, uh, industrial carbonization, and for, uh, and for um, uh, carbon dioxide transport, we, uh, uh, there's the road sector, international shipping, uh, synthetic fuels, uh, international aviation, uh, possibly. So we cut across quite a large number of areas outside of the uh, working parties that we report to normally. So I, I, I see a very good function for a coordination group that uh, can cover a broader uh, set of um, uh, uh, TCPs and uh, interest areas. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go now to the city's uh, TCP, Helmut. Mm, okay, many thanks. Uh, I'm quite new here in this round, as it's the youngest TCP, and it's a cross-cutting TCP, and I want to follow up uh, the, 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 some inputs before, and mm, have, oh, sorry, many thanks, uh, sorry, and have uh, one remark and uh, one, uh, I would say, one input maybe for a further discussion. One remark is about the requested guidance from uh, CERT uh, and working party to TCPs. Uh, as far as I see, there are a lot of TCPs focusing on technologies. It was mentioned as being silos before. Uh, and some other TCPs like the cities TCP or users, for example, uh, or equality, who are focusing on uh, cross-cutting issues and linking technologies and non-technological aspects. And um, so on the one hand side, I would um, ask if there's a strategic advice in when it comes to extension or in development of strategic plans to have focus on technologies or non-technological aspects in those TCPs who are uh, working on that field to have some linkages there. That's the request and the, uh, the input for discussion, for further discussion would be how can we uh, define or redefine TCPs because there are some technological and non-technological oriented TCPs and maybe this uh, uh, TCPs focused on target groups like cities or end users or users uh, could act as a platform for the technological uh, TCPs uh, to to bring results or research projects, joint research projects uh, to a new community of researchers. That would be my request to discuss that um, and that new role of some of these TCPs. And thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to continue along the list. We have a few TCPs with flags up. I just wanted to remind CERT delegates as well to please feel free to raise your flag and talk about uh, the priorities within your countries uh, also. Uh, next on my list is the energy efficient uh, end use equipment uh, TCP, uh, Hans Paul. Thank you, Amanda, and uh, good morning, everybody. 
very great to see uh, all of you here in uh, in Paris, even with a short walk uh, in the fresh air, as uh, Timur said. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, I have two remarks. One is regarding, <clears throat> say, the coordination and uh, the coordination of complexity. Uh, and the other, uh, indeed, the, the, the correlation or the cooperation uh, with societal aspects. Uh, regarding the complexity, uh, I've always wondered, uh, indeed, uh, the society and especially en energy transition is complex. But if we mirror with our organizational structure the complexity, uh, then I don't think we will come very far. Uh, organizations are meant to reduce complexity uh, and I think that is something to uh, maybe to keep in mind even if that means that at some point there is a bit of an overlap or things being do done double uh, as far as we know it and, and we monitor it I don't think there's any harm uh, because also the doubling is mostly on those topics uh, like, for instance, heat pump, hydrogen, uh, flexibility, uh, where there is most attention needed uh, from uh, society. Uh, in that respect, I also very much welcome the new uh, setup of the coordination groups, uh, which are, uh, say, focusing on those uh, cross-cutting and coordination aspects that are really uh, wanted by the governments uh, at a certain point in time and therefore these should also be have a limited uh, time frame uh, and second uh, uh, connection with society I very much welcome and I've already said that uh, when I was presenting the extension for the 4E in the end use working party I very much welcome the uh, the offer from the Equality TCP to help us uh, with guidance and guidelines and maybe webinars on, on how to implement uh, this cross-cutting aspect uh, in uh, our TCP and in other TCPs. And I think that that is uh, certainly uh, of, uh, of great value. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll now go to the Energy and Buildings uh, and Communities TCP, Paul. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, great pleasure to be here today uh, with all colleagues. Um, first of all, I'd like to uh, take up the offer from um, my colleague uh, from the Equality TCP for some help. We have actually drafted a equality, diversity and inclusion policy um, recently within energy and buildings and communities, and we'd certainly appreciate some help in uh, finalizing that. So thank you for that. Um, I'd like to raise a, a topic of sort of cross TCP uh, activity and I'm slightly hesitant to raise it because it's the topic of, of digital systems uh, which of course we've just experienced the problem with um, and uh, but uh, as you'll be aware they pervade across all areas of society uh, technology infrastructure these days and, and there's an increasing need for them to communicate with each other in order that we can effectively operate our buildings and other assets and, and uh, support societal aims. Uh, in buildings, we have uh, seen a massive transformation over the last decade in digital systems for designing, construction, constructing and operating buildings. And uh, we have a number of ongoing annexes now which look at the importance of digital systems to manage energy effectively and efficiently and increasingly for buildings to be able to interact with energy supply systems, transport systems, and, and many other areas of infrastructure. So I think digitalization is probably an important area for cross TCP coordination and activity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have uh, heat pumping technologies. Uh, Monica, over to you. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, I will make uh, it short, but I will, from the TCP's perspective, just uh, bring in that we really much appreciate these activities in order to find ways for uh, co uh, make collaborative activities between the TCP's and the coordination groups. Uh, I think it's high value and very important. And I fully agree that digitalization could be one such an area. 
where we need to make a lot of cross-cutting activities. Thank you very much. Uh, Perhaps just a note, I have three, uh, three uh, more flags on my list, uh, and then perhaps we will break uh, for the coffee. Um, so next is uh, users, uh, David. Well, thank you. I was, I've been thinking, wrestling, as I suspect many of us have, with how we can translate a widespread desire for more Cross TCP collaboration into practice. And just to pick up on Paul's suggestion and, and Monica's reinforcement of something, for example, like digitalization, I think we need to pick tasks which have certain characteristics. I think those tasks need to be ones that can be, to coin a kind of computer science term, parallelized. So we can take a larger objective and break it into chunks that can be executed in parallel in separate TCPs. But we can construct an architecture which brings what is returned from each TCP back into an integrated whole. So I think that there are certain classes of cross-cutting challenge which will lend themselves more easily to cross-TCP collaboration. But I think we really need to establish perhaps a small working group with TCPs about the, the mechanics and the practice of making this work and think of those examples we can use to demonstrate success. So potentially starting, rather than starting with the challenge, starting with the class of problem that is most amenable to being addressed with a cross TCP platform and then doing that as an exemplar and learning from that practice and then iterating that and broadening that out. So just some reflections, because I think there is quite a, a level of not so much concern, but mindfulness of the challenges of operationalizing these ideas of cross TCP collaboration, some thoughts. Thanks, David. Those are very helpful. So I'm going to read through who's on my list. I do want to give people a chance to speak uh, if you've raised your flag. I also want to make sure that uh, I'm giving you enough time uh, to collaborate in the hallways during coffee break. So I'll ask you to keep uh, your interventions uh, fairly short, just in the interest of covering everyone, but still having uh, time to uh, connect outside of this room. Uh, so next on the list is energy storage. Bert. Okay, thank you. Very short. Um, I want to raise only one, one topic here because we give quite a lot of information to the third, eh? information coming from all our tasks, but it's not for us, not always clear what the third is really doing with this information. And that's sometimes frustrating even. So I would like to ask for more feedback, to more communication so that at least that we can help to bring sign-based information to you so that we all can give that information to our stake to our stakeholders so well very short thank you very much very helpful uh now we have uh high temperature superconductivity uh laura thank you very much and just uh, one remark uh, our tcp is uh, strongly technology oriented but uh, the benefits of uh, high temperature superconductivity devices uh, will be uh, mainly in the power grid uh, that is uh, a cross cutting uh, issue not only for renewables but for all the generation uh, park and also for the energy system of the future Thank you very much. Uh, we're now going to go to a uh, CERT delegate, uh, European Commission. Thank you very much. Um, as I said yesterday, the Commission has adopted last week communication on the revision of the SET plan. The SET plan includes implementation working groups, which are somehow very uh, similar to some of the TCPs here. And we are proposing an innovative approach for cross-cutting issues, which is to have specific experts uh, working in a short term 
with uh, the implementation working group, which could be the TCPs here, to design research tools, not only IDs, but research tools, models, guidelines, and so on, to tackle the cross-cutting issues into the work of the implementation working group on technologies. So it's very pragmatic. And among the uh, cross-cutting, you have digitalization, users' needs, you have also access to market circularity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Uh, we'll go now to uh, photovoltaic uh, power systems. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just a few quick words on the importance of uh, inter-task collaboration. Uh, I think PVPS uh, thinks that there could be quite a list of, of topics that are highly important and that TCPs could work on uh, together. Uh, having said that, we also acknowledge that today it's been quite hard to do so. Uh, there's a recent example of wind TCP uh, with the hydrogen TCP and PVPS working in, I think it was in Boulder, Colorado, to work on what could become a mutual task on green hydrogen this time around. So that's very welcome. We also welcome the uh, proposed uh, restructuring of, of the IA uh, CERT committee, etc. I think that opens uh, the door um to to better cooperation it's also highly welcome that the ia itself can participate in tasks we think that's very valuable as well so thank you thank you very much uh we'll now go to isgan thank you and i second um what you said so collabor collaborations between the tcps are very welcome uh, from our point of perspective so um we really uh, would value sharing best practices between the TCPs, um, maybe have some value in face-to-face -face workshops, um, for example, on uh, how do others handle sponsors in their TCPs? Um, is there any guidelines for new secretariats? Um, and also an IEA 101 for new EXCO members would be very helpful. So that's something that we could collaborate on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Lithuania. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I would like to respond to the first question uh, about the government's current priorities in, in energy technology related policy and research. So I, I represent the Ministry of Energy of Lithuania uh, here in, in uh, CERT. So um, and as a ministry, we are currently begun to updating our national energy independence strategy. It's quite a, a regular um, exercise every five, six years when we define our medium-term and long-term priorities. But, and it's in one sen sentence, it's all about green transition. It's still uh, an early draft, so, um, uh, but it has an R&D and I component, a technology component in it. And I'm tasked to, to, to draft it actually. So I have some preliminary priority orientations. I will go very quickly through them, not, not taking all, much of the time. So uh, one part is about solar and wind technologies. So. Um, the idea is to have more effective ways to, to utilize electricity from these sources, but also some future, uh, maybe technological breakthroughs in this uh, sense. We also have energy storage, especially batteries. Uh, I'll bundling in one uh, green hydrogen power to extend e-fuels. Uh, also heat pumps of industrial size, uh, mostly for, for heating purposes as some um, uh, more than half of the, our country's heating is coming from centralized uh, sources, and most of that is coming from bio biomass. So we look further in the future to, 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 to diversify this, this technology mix to heat pumps. And um, yeah, finally, it's uh, smart grids, smart cities, digitalization, and consumer involvement. So I'm lo we're looking forward to, to cooperating with you on this. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, I see one last uh, flag up. I can't. Uh, district heating. I see two. District heating. Um, district heating and then combustion. Perfect. Um, yeah, I, I just thought it was, might be worth uh, mentioning as digitalization has been uh, mentioned by um, two, uh, two delegates here. Um, uh, we also feel that digitalization is uh, something that cuts across uh, many uh, technologies, but I thought it might be just worth mentioning that uh, we actually have um, coming up in uh, three weeks or so, four weeks or so, um, a workshop reporting on a major project on digitalization. Obviously it's been in the realms of district heating and cooling. That's on the 20th and 21st of 
November in Berlin. And on the 22nd, uh, we'll be scoping out the follow-on uh, project for that. So if there are uh, people that might be interested in putting forward some uh, cross-cutting elements from their own programs, that might be a perfect opportunity, 20th to the 22nd uh, in Berlin. And I can give uh, further details bilaterally if anyone's interested. Wonderful, thank you so much. Uh, Combustion TCP, please. Okay, thank you. And I've been hesitating to raise this flag, but following up on the Lithuania comments on alignment with government priorities, uh, the Combustion TCP is really focused on technology development and removing barriers to deployment of promising technologies. It's incumbent on us to understand and identify what technologies are likely to have an impact in a politically uncertain future. And I am concerned and would just ask that we approach thoughtfully the idea of aligning the TCPs with uh, the priorities of current government. Some of us uh, work in environments where the political priorities can flip 180 degrees every four years and uh, it creates a difficult situation. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. All right. I don't see any last minute flags going up. So I want to thank all of you for uh, the very excellent interventions. Uh, certainly lots of uh, food for thought. I know many of us have been taking notes uh, and it gives us a lot to think about uh, as we continue our thinking and our discussions uh, through the next couple of days. Um, we're going to break now for coffee. Uh, there is uh, coffee just outside the room where it was uh, this morning. Um, I'm going to ask people to be back in here at 11.30, so that's 20 minutes. Hopefully that's enough time to, to grab a quick bite and uh, drink and uh, make some connections. When we come back, we're going to uh, focus in on a session uh, that looks at uh, 50 years of uh, technology collaboration and uh, what that means in terms of preparations for the next IEA ministerial meeting. So thank you.
hear a lot of noise still from outside. Maybe, um, yeah, maybe we can get them in before we start because we want to get everyone's views. Mm. We want everyone to connect and network, but uh, not too much, please. It's okay. not too, uh, not too time to work. So. Okay, so thank you for coming back um, and um, thank you for the excellent um, session that we just had, the first session. Um, I had a couple of conversations over the um, coffee break and um, with some of the colleagues um, from the TCPs and um, maybe a personal reflection here. Um, I'm very happy to hear the very positive feedback we, ge we get on these um, new coordination groups. Um, on the one hand, on the other hand, um, please, this is also the opportunity for you to raise, I mean, not now in this session, but, you know, at the margins or later or whatever, um, uh, to raise anything that uh, might hold you back from participating. You, know, um, you have the cert um, at the table, um, many governments at the table. If um, you feel um, there is something that holds you back, be it from, say, information, the secretariat doesn't uh, inform you well enough or you don't know enough what's going on in the other TCPs or um, funding, um, that uh, some pragmatic issues, so then this is the opportunity to raise it. So we are not here to just exchange nice words and good ideas, but also um, put some of the uh, issues on the table if um, you want to do that. Anyway, we are now coming to the session on the IEA's uh, ministerial meeting taking place next year. And um, it's a very important um, milestone. I said that earlier in uh, my opening remarks. Um, uh, it's the 50 years anniversary, so it's also in some ways the 50 years of uh, anniversary of um, the um, TCPs and in, in, I mean, uh, or approaching that. Um, so I would really like to, and our member governments want the same, to make a real point about um, technology RD&D you know, and um, the importance of it. Um, it has evolved, as I tried to say in the beginning, from a perspective that is very energy security oriented. You know, how can you reduce energy consumption in order to um, improve um, energy security to um, a much broader um, portfolio of questions um, uh, from how to address climate change to a more systemic type of questions. Uh, we have heard that in, um, in the interventions from several of um, the TCPs, social kind of questions, et cetera, et cetera. But in any case, it's collaboration oriented, it's uh, rd and oriented. And um, I think we have a lot of good stories to tell, um, or at least I hope so, um, about um, the collaboration efforts of the last um, 50 years. And on, on the one hand, and this is one of the objectives that we are um, trying to work towards. We have that uh, energy innovation forum that we've been asked to um, uh, set up um, in the context of the uh, ministerial meeting. Um, and so it will be a good point to reflect on what's been achieved, but also to look forward and set ambitions um, for the next years for uh, us as the secretariat for the technology uh, related work, but also the network it, uh, itself, including the CERT, its working parties and uh, the TCPs. So we have uh, basically, uh, two guiding questions um, that uh, we would like to discuss with you uh, today in this uh, session. The first one is um, the kind of strategic guidance you would like to um, see on energy technology, RD&D, &D, um, coming from the ministerial meeting. Is there anything that you need from the ministers, uh, not only from the secretariat, the cert, etc., but really from the ministers? Is there high-level uh, principles that you're um, interested to um, to see coming out of the ministerial me meeting? This is one element. The other question is um, this, about the stories or messages you would like to share um, for um, the IEA's energy technology narrative at um, the IEA ministerial uh, meeting. Um, to start with the second question, I would uh, like to hand over to um, Paul Lucas from the uh, Hydrogen TCP. Um, we've said it in the beginning, um, hydrogen TCP from the beginning of, um, of uh, the IA journey in many ways. Uh, it was already one of the initial areas that governments identified as an area of cooperation in the 1970s. So Paul, um, please over to you. Thank you very much. I am very honored to, 
to represent the oldest TCP here. And uh, I, I had a look on the on the history of the TCP um, because we keep uh, we keep the, the the minutes of the of the first exco meeting. And uh, maybe I can I can send you if you if you need. In fact, uh, at the beginning of '75, uh, a working party on hydrogen was created. It was very interesting. There is some 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 details here. Because why? Because uh, in fact, um, uh, hydrogen T hydrogen thematic or TCP follows the IEA story. At this time, energy security was the main priority because we were just after the first oil crisis. And some countries like Germany, Netherlands, etc., was very concerned by, by the, the future of the chemical industry and the uh, industry in general. And it's the reason why they decide to look for the future, how to produce hydrogen. Uh, and at that time, it was mainly from nuclear energy. The first topic on hydrogen TCP, led by Germany, was how to couple a nuclear reactor with uh, hydrogen production, with thermochemical cycle electrolysis. And the first task, task one, two, three, four, was on, on this aspect. So it was the reason why, after two years of the working party, the working party said, OK, now we finish our work, and we want to create what they call implementing agreement. So in 77, the, in October or in August, I don't remember, the, the, the first uh, ex-co meeting was, uh, was initiated. And uh, it started like that, energy security. No, no, of course, not a word on climate change, etc., because it was too early. And after, step by step, um, they said, OK, but uh, hydrogen production is a good, but maybe we can have a look on the hydrogen storage, hydrogen transportation, etc. And step by step, new task appears, uh, and not only on technology side, but also on system integration. So it's a reason why, step by step, the scope, and now our TCP is focused, as I mentioned before, on the whole value chain of hydrogen from low carbon source. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's a DNA, DNA of our, uh, our, our TCP to work on the whole value chain, taking into account all low carbon. Of course, now, uh, the main driver are not energy security is coming back now, but of course we take into account the, the driver of climate change and CO2 emission, of course. So now, after 45 years, near, near 48 years, uh, we are uh, we achieve or we are in total uh, 48 tasks. In fact, we are very close to 50 tasks in one year, 50 tasks, 50 years, and 100 ex committing. It will be in one year, so I think we will celebrate also this uh, this uh, good number just two years after the IEA because we are we are sh shift uh, two years, and now of course we are very focused on the, also on technology uh, development on the of course on R and D, and we are very proud of what we achieve because what I can say is that uh, very early we have a look on the very low TRL technologies. Like before the 80s, we, have, we started a, a work on photoelectrochemical uh, process to produce hydrogen. You know, it was uh, 40 years ago. So we have a balance now between uh, low TRL, uh, of course, uh, mainstream technology like electrolysis, uh, storage, and all the use of hydrogen, <coughs> including hydrogen for industry, which is very important, and hydrogen carrier. Now we, we want to extend, and for that we need a lot of collaboration. It's the reason why um, we, we have now uh, starting collaboration with other TCP, but also with external organizations outside IEA, like uh, the sister organization I, uh, NEA in nuclear field, uh, some other uh, international initiative on hydrogen. There is many, many, maybe too much. And uh, our challenge is to manage our growth because we are 30, uh, 33, 33 uh, countries and many countries are asking for uh, uh, for membership. We have to manage this external collaboration, uh, which is not so easy. And of course, to integrate uh, hydrogen in the energy system. So uh, of course, I am just the one of the chair of, the, of this uh, long story. I want just to thank uh, the first chair, Jean-Pierre Conzen from European Commission, who created this TCP at, the, at that time, implementing agreement. 
And of course, um, uh, I think the our DNA will, uh, from the beginning, will uh, will guide us to to uh, to very good success, including also not only technical tasks, but but cross cutting tasks like safety. Safety was a like a permanent task in our effort, and now tasks like certification, etc. So. I don't know if I, uh, the three minutes are over, but uh, it was I, I wanted to say, and I, I will be very happy to collaborate with uh, IES Secretariat for preparing the the 50th anniversary. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Paul. And um, as a German, I'm <laughs> surprised to hear about um, not surprised is the wrong word, but um, uh, struck to hear the similarities in terms of interest um, to today. You know, um, how to replace. Um, uh, hydrogen uh, in the chemical industry, that's what you said, you know, was the main pre preoccupation at the time. And I think it's the same today, even though the pathway will differ now, uh, no longer nuclear in Germany, but uh, renewable hydrogen. But other than that, very important topic at the time and uh, today again. Now, um, turning to the next um, topic here, um, or next uh, technology, if you want, um, we did a very special analysis in uh, the context of energy technology perspectives a couple of years ago. Uh, in 2020, in fact, um, to better understand how long it takes for certain key technologies to move from uh, the laboratory to the market. And WIND is, a, is an example um, from uh, which we um, learned a lot. Um, I'm uh, sure Stefan from the WIND TCP can say a few more words about what the TCP has gone through um, uh, in this um, long um, period. Um, I think that might be the wrong uh, slide. Um, um, and uh, it would be good to understand how um, what has happened you know, in the wind TCP and how you see the role in the transition um, uh, for um, the wind technologies from the lab to the market. So the role of the TCP in that uh, context. Um, Stefan? I, I don't have a slide. Uh, thank you. Um, just to, to give a, sh a short talk about what happened in wind. We're a bit younger than hydrogen. Um, first annual report is from 78. Um, all of our annual reports are uh, as PDF on our website. So if you have an interest to see another typewriter written document, uh, be my guest, have a look. We started with 13, con 13 countries and four uh, annexes at that time. And if you look at the title of those annexes, they are already dealing with environmental impact, the energy system, uh, siting and integration into uh, into the system and the, the uh, large scale uh, wind conversion. And these tasks or annexes at that time really defined the topical areas we are in, uh, operating now in. So we have many more tasks, but they're still organized in this logical structure. And there's good reason for that because the machines became very, very big. And with that, the complexity of course grew uh, enormously. Um, the, the advantage of having IA for this global collaboration at that time, clearly that was the one place to go for international collaboration. Um, in the meantime, there are other um, networks on a European level or in, in Asia or, or in the United States, but for global agreement on what's needed as grand challenges, for example, their IEA win really is the place to be. And without any doubt, all stakeholders accept that forum as the international global forum to uh, come forward with these kind of strategies. And to give you two examples uh, that we use to communicate our outcomes um, that are appreciated. One are recommended practices that we do. These are pre-normative standards where the industry, again, on a global level agrees um, how to do stuff before there might be uh, like an IEC standard. And the other uh, thing is what we introduced in uh, 2019. Um, we're going to do every three, four years now, topical expert meetings on grand challenges on wind. And that is really collecting the experts' opinion of all experts within the IEA countries uh, on a global scale. And what really is interesting and nice to see there, people are not coming, showing up with their hobby topics or want to make a pitch for their own area they're working to get funding. It's really looking what is needed to, to bring the industry forward and roll out that technology. And I wouldn't know any better place or other place except IA, um, how to do that. So we really appreciate being part of this great family. Thank you very much, Stefan. Very encouraging to hear and um, uh, really great examples. Um, 
uh, also good good to hear your perspective on how things have evolved because every um, obviously there are many international fora as you said um, but it's great to see how the TCP has uh, continued to establish itself as a go-to place um, for um, answering um, the type of questions around um, uh, wind. Um, next uh, is our colleagues from the Smart Grids TCP. Uh, don't press the button too quickly <laughs> so I can finish what Pear put together for me. So <laughs> that'd be great. Um, uh, because we would like to say here that ISCAN is a very um, good example of a TCP that operates both under the IEA but also under the um, Clean Energy Ministerial. Um, and so it is a very good example um, to show how um, a TCP can both be relevant from a policy as well as a technology perspective and how um, this um, plays out in practice. So now, Vicky, over to you. Thank you. Um... Yeah, so ISCAN, the International Smart Grid Action Network, um, is committed to identifying emerging advances and sharing best practices, but also raising high-level governmental awareness on smart grids. Um, the ISCAN TCP, as we said, sets itself apart by being both a SEM and an IEA initiative. Um, and in, in addition, uh, as shown on the slide, we have six permanent working groups. Um, can you, one press of the button? On the slide, sorry, I made some, uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, so for the achievements, um, I chose to highlight our knowledge sharing methods in ISCAN. Um, we are, of course, um, yeah, delivering many different outputs um, in ISCAN uh, for dissemination. And we believe that communication is key regarding deployment and impact. Um, and this is also why we have a working group dedicated to only this. Um, the communications working group relates to both the internal communication, but also the external communication uh, within ISCAN. So it, um, for example, it, it structures the way that we communicate so that we ensure a clear, coherent message, but also that we talk to each other and understand each other internally, not only externally. Um, as an example, we have the latest knowledge sharing project where the communication working group were responsible to facilitate um, uh, uh, yeah, a workshop aiming at producing policy briefs for the SEM. Um, it was on network planning and decision-making under uncertainty. So doing this by engaging both our working groups uh, internal expert, but also talking to TSOs and DSOs, policymakers and research institutes um, in 12 different countries um, and gathering inputs from IRENA. So it's um, a focal point um, to gather knowledge. Um, yeah, so another successful achievement I would say in ISCAN is our ISCAN Award of Excellence. Um, we have had great success with recognizing and highlighting um, successful smart grid projects around the world. So not only related to ISCAN projects, but more broadly, um, winners and runner-ups are mentioned at the SEM side events. And this year they were at multiple side events. So it really great, it gets great exposure um, at a high level audience. Uh, and this also, of course, furthers our mission of smart grid deployment. And meanwhile, this could, of course, not happen uh, or be achieved without our global collaboration, um, which brings me to the strengths. Uh, naturally, ISCAN are collaborating um, across sectors and, and a lot of different initiatives under IA and SEM um, and other sector relevant networks. And I mentioned some on the slide. Um, yeah, which are maybe the closest relations that we have. And while the TCPs are very distinct in focus, uh, I would say, um, as we talked about today, we are becoming more interconnected and we are in ISCAN very much aware of this and our cross-disciplinary approach, I would say, fosters synergy. Uh, and we believe that we will collaborate even more closely with other TCPs and other networks in future. So yeah, that's something that we are focusing on. Also, um, yeah, we, um, we believe that this is a, a very good global reach platform where we can create credible but also impactful uh, policy messages. That was my speech. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Vicky. Um, 
Moving now to a very different technology area to uh, Keith from the greenhouse gas um, uh, R&D TCP. Um, if you could um, talk a bit about the key outcomes of the T TCP over the years, it's been very active, a very big uh, conference as well. And what uh, role you, you see for yourself in the international energy uh, landscape? Uh, Keith, over to you. Uh, thank you, Timo. <clears throat> so the uh, I think we have a slide to uh, come up, but our formal name is the IEA Greenhouse Gas. Uh, no, it's a slide before that. Our formal name is the IEA Greenhouse Gas R&D Programme. Within the IEA uh, family, we're known as the GHG TCP, but uh, outside of that and internationally, we're probably uh, better known as um, the IEA GHG. Uh, we have 38 members, uh, 18 contracting parties, mainly, uh, ma ma mainly um, uh, countries, but we also have the European Commission and OPEC. Uh, Denmark is our most recent uh, member who rejoined us uh, and... Um, we have 20 sponsor members, and uh, our most recent sponsor member is PDO, or Petroleum Development OMAN. Um, here you can see a list of our, uh, um, uh, we were looking at the sli uh, slide before this, but this, but this one is fine. Um, uh, shows our accomplishments uh, since we were formed in 1991, so thir uh, 32 years uh, ago. If I start with the uh, knowledge sharing, actually, the uh, third bullet point down, we uh, that this uh, technical reports take up most, most of our uh, most of the time of the technical staff. We published over 360 of those now. Uh, we publish about 10 to 12 a year, and all of these are so, uh, the topics for all of these are selected by our executive committee. We run a number of uh, networks. Um, Examples of those are on the story side, we have the, the uh, monitoring network and uh, risk management network. Uh, we also have the CCS cost network. Our most recent uh, cost network meeting earlier this year was hosted by the University of Groningen and the uh, proceedings of that is due out uh, very shortly. Uh, we're also we were all, we were also founder of, uh, of a journal, international journal of GHG, uh, control this journal um, uh, or much of the much of the research uh, on uh, CCUS and CDR technologies are published uh, is published in this journal. International uh, CCS summer schools each year we run a summer school uh, for young professionals from industry or academia. <laughs> or and academia. We have about 50 attendees a year. It's been held annually since 2007, and we currently have around 700 alumni from more than 60 countries. Uh, some of the uh, uh, attendees from our earlier conferences now occupy senior roles in, uh, in uh, industry and academia, focusing still on, uh, on CCUS and uh, CDR technologies. UNFCCC related, we're a trusted advisor to uh, international bodies, well, the, 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 the IEA, but also uh, bodies of the uh, UNFCCC. Um, we attend annually the uh, COP meetings we used to attend under the auspices of the uh, IEA, but now, uh, but now we are affiliated in our own right. At the last nine COP meetings, we have organized or co-organized the only official CCS side event. And uh, that, 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 that uh, we also have, are doing so at the uh, forthcoming COP meeting in the uh, Middle East. We're active in the London protocol and have been engaged in all CCS amendments under that uh, protocol, most recently removing barriers to enable cross border movement of uh, CO2 for storage. Um, 
We're accredited uh, expert reviewers for in the IPCC assessment reports, and we made substantive input to, uh, to the IPCC's special report on CCS. Pioneering CCS projects, we have uh, had substantive roles in uh, earlier uh, CCS projects, uh, including the uh, uh, SACS project, the uh, Weyburn project, and the Air Products uh, Carbon Capture project at Port Arthur. And finally, our uh, uh, conference series, we are guardians of uh, two major uh, conferences. Um, uh, one, the, uh, the, the, the largest one, the Greenhouse Gas Control Technologies Conference, GHGT series, um, that uh, attracts over a thousand uh, delegates every, every two years. And the next one will be uh, next year being hosted by, uh, in Canada, in Calgary. We, uh, that's GHGT uh, 17 and uh, a lot of work is going on presently in uh, organization of that conference. Secondly, we organize and uh, uh, coordinate the post-combustion capture conference series uh, the most recent one was in September of this year, so just a few weeks ago, and hosted by the USDOE uh, Nettle in Pittsburgh, uh, US. So that's just a flavor of some of the activities and accomplishments that we undertake at, um, uh, at uh, IEA GH or GHETCP. And we have seen internationally and from recent uh, IEA publications that uh, CCUS and CDR technologies occupy, are, 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 are essential if we're to uh, meet our, uh, our 2030, 2050 targets. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keith. Um, uh moving from greenhouse gas storage to energy storage as the next uh, one. Um, certainly an area that is uh, already important, but is uh, without any doubts gonna be critical for um, future clean energy systems. So curious to hear um, the views from uh, Bert about uh, history of the TCP and the role moving forward. Thank you. Okay. Sorry for pushing the button a little bit too early. Um, and also sorry because I interpreted the question a little bit different because it was asked to give our thoughts on the strengths of the TCP network. So uh, apologize if you want to know more in detail about the energy storage TCP, maybe you can subscribe our newsletter. So, okay, um, saying, having said that, uh, our TCP, it's more than 40 years of experience. We are now at our 96th executive committee which means that we are already here for 43 years. And we also have today 43 tasks, or task 43 is running at the moment. So, but um, one of, I, I have listed seven bullets here, uh, which were our thoughts on, on the TCP network. As already mentioned at the beginning, uh, by you already, that uh, at the beginning, years ago, 10, 50 years ago, we see more and more focus on climate change. So also the TCP network gained in attention and attractiveness. We also see that in our TCP in the last couple of years, uh, we have regrowed with five extra countries and one sponsor. So it means every year one extra country. Um, we also see a change on focus on technical solutions towards a more integrated system oriented approach. We also see that in RTCP, so sector coupling, smart design, control of energy storage systems, and so on. And in our opinion, it's a quite important change. Um, it's also one of the, the good things is that the network, it's uh, give us the ability to mobilize the whole network so that there is enormous potential in the past and also, um, and it will continue also to offer a yeah, sorry, an enormous potential in the future for influencing national global energy research and energy and climate policy. Um, it makes it also possible to combine forces to bring research into application and implementation. 
in a much more targeted and rapid manner. That was also mentioned by one of the previous speakers. Um, and I think one of the important things also is that it enables smaller countries and emerging economies with smaller budgets to share knowledge so that it saves time and money for them. But we are not perfect. Nobody is perfect. So despite of all the successes, we are not there yet. We can contribute better in the future. And we can do that by an improved exchange between the TCPs, by avoidance of duplication. I think that's a very important one. And that's one of the roles I also see for the third and the working parties. Uh, cross TCP work, increased transfer of findings to energy policy, uh, and also if we look to our own TCP, more attention to the full potential of storage, etc. So I think this is a task for the whole IEA, not only for the TCPs. We cannot do that by our own. Um, and if you look to the future, no storage, no energy transition. So uh, RTCP has the opportunity to connect all the different dots in the renewable energy system. And that's also what we will and want to do. So thank you. Thank you very much, Bert. Um, now opening the floor to the whole group and um, coming back to some of the um, questions that we are particularly interested in. There are two ones. Um, what kind of strategic guidance are you expecting from the ministerial um, meeting coming forward next year? Um, and at the same time, um, some, do you have any stories, uh, stories messages to share um, um, that can help us establish a narrative at um, the ministerial meeting around technology R&D? Um, I would like to probably just, before I give over, uh, hand over to anyone who would like to make a comment, we have roughly 20 minutes in this session and um, uh, we will also hear from um, Paolo, the secretary of the um, group um, later in this meeting. So we don't have that much time, but I would like to make you aware of the opportunity here. You know that uh, a ministerial meeting is where around 40 ministers ca are coming from all around the world. Um, there are uh, CEOs from large uh, international um, companies coming to the IEA from the entire energy spectrum, um, from fossil fuels to renewables to whatever it is, anything is uh, represented there. And we have that, as I said, opportunity of an energy innovation forum where we're going to invite startups as well and um, other actors, academics uh, in the space. Um, this is an opportunity to showcase what you're doing, you know, what the TCP um, is, uh, network is all about, um, what is the value that it brings to um, international r and um, I said it in the beginning, it's sometimes very difficult to make a case for international collaboration. It's very difficult to be tangible here. So whatever you have to share that is tangible, that um, we can bring to the attention that we, we are planning to do a video um, about the history of innovation, the role of the TCPs there, and I'm going to try to nudge the ministers a bit and every all the other um, uh, participants there uh, to hear what they are expecting from us, where they see the priorities moving uh, in the context of the wider strategic uh, objectives um, that um, they have, keeping in mind what was also said by the combustion TCP earlier today, that um, of course priorities change over time, but I think the broader framework is there. And so please take it as a real opportunity and help us make the case for um, uh, the TCPs, um, uh, the work of the TCPs and what they, uh, you need from the ministers to, uh, to improve um, things moving forward. Um, so I did not follow specifically who went first, so I'll just go from left to right first and then we'll see how it goes. Um, uh, turn it over to Wind. Yeah, thank you. For, um, so especially for, for the wind industry, probably you're aware that um, the, the manufacturers are struggling at the moment um, to make any kind of money. They're making losses. So it's really a challenging environment. And you see that governments now set up roadmaps to have a clear pathway and a, and a ramp up that is guaranteed so that they can invest and evolve their industry. And what we would really be happy to see these long-term roadmaps guaranteeing activities and, and, and also financial support to have that also for the supporting R&D activities. Because it is up and down over the years in different countries and that makes it really challenging to come forward with a stable R&D roadmap. And, and I think that needs to go hand in hand. Industry, for the industry, that's probably the most important, but also supporting the, the, um, um, the, the R&D path next to that. Excellent points. Um, uh, right next users, TCP, David. 
Yeah, thanks. I think, again, this is in the context of the sort of strategic guidance on R&D priorities. I think we need a substantial increase in the emphasis on monitoring and evaluation technologies. As we deploy really quickly, there's going to be a lot of unintended consequences, particularly as we get system integration. So we need technologies like national scale observatories, digital twins, living laboratories that can pick up policy successes and failures and iteratively refine and improve those technologies. And that's everything also from satellite technologies through to smartphone apps that sit in the pocket of the heat pump installer to make sure the heat pump is working properly. This whole suite of technologies we, we do some work on, but that will need to ramp up hugely. I think there's a real challenge with the skills pipeline. I think the TCP community should think about what it does to help foster the skills pipeline, both in terms of policy expertise, but also R&D expertise, particularly in the, the sort of developing country context. And I think we need to, we, we currently plan systems for a one and a half degree world. We need systems that will work in a three and a half degree world. And I don't know whether we're putting enough emphasis on systems that decompose elegantly to deliver safe systems in a three and a half degree world, which is kind of where we're headed at the moment. Thank you very much, David. And uh, maybe on the skills pipeline, I think um, we heard a good example here about summer schools from the greenhouse gas um, TCP. So, um, but um, I'm sure there are other um, approaches. Um, turning now to Brian from Edsup. Thank you, uh, Timur. Um, just answering the second question first, um, ETSAP, like the hydrogen TCP, started in 1976. And I think the clear benefit of um, ETSAP at the time was addressing a gap that was there because we, we were facing, the world was facing an oil crisis, was about to go into another. And there weren't modeling tools to actually guide policymakers in how to respond to that. Um, so a, a key narrative from my perspective from ETSAP was, you know, preparing us for the future in a way that we were really uh, drastically affected by the oil crisis at the time to, to avoid that happening in the future. And the, um, of course, the tools initially Markal and then Times um, developed and responded to new policy goals, particularly around climate, coupling that with energy security. And now we see these tools being used in about 70 countries around the world, including the IEA, as you mentioned, to, to inform policy decisions uh, around the future of uh, energy system evolution. So that's on the narrative piece. In, in terms of a, 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 a kind of question or, or strategic guidance um, point for, for governments, I, I think w one of the challenges is in all of what we do is this bridging between the analysis and the policy. Um, and there's, there's two dimensions to that. We need to improve how we communicate, how we engage, but the policy system needs to also uh, adjust and build absorptive capacity. So that, that, that's the piece I'd suggest to bring to the attention of the, uh, the, the ministers would be to, to increase their efforts to build absorptive capacity in the policy system to be able to, to harness the uh, analysis coming from the, the research and the analytical communities. Um, because that bridging is can bring huge benefits, but it, it doesn't happen by itself. Uh, and it does require um, resources. One of the key challenges I find in engaging with government departments is the, the limitations of bandwidth that they have. And so enabling, providing for uh, civil servants and politicians uh, to, to actually time and bandwidth to engage with analysis, I think is, is the key thing I'd suggest. And there's a number of bridging mechanisms uh, I can suggest if of interest, but, but getting that point across, I think is the first step. Thank you. Yeah, most excellent points, really. Thank you a lot. So th thanks a lot, Brian. And that's, a, I mean, what you explained on the modeling side is a very tangible, um, indeed, uh, success story. You know? uh, 
that we should all build upon. And um, if you have similar stories to tell from your TCPs, you know, where, uh, where it came from, what it has achieved, please, uh, please share that with us. Moving over to energy and buildings, please. Thank you. Um, mine's a simple request for the ministers uh, about funding. <laughs> um, I think there's an issue, uh, certainly uh, within our TCP, in a significant difference between the approach to funding uh, that's available to uh, participants in our programs. Uh, in some countries, there are dedicated funds available to participate in IEA programs. In others, there aren't. In others, there are something in between, maybe encouragement within the existing R&D framework programs and so forth. And um, I, I think we, we all know the benefits of, of the international collaboration that we participate in here. And, and we, everybody around the table could regale you with stories of the, those benefits from um, each of our TCPs. But I, I think there would be a, um, an important benefit if the ministers were able to uh, look at um, how they approach funding in this area and to see if there are more consistent mechanisms that could be adopted. I would also say if the ministries themselves were actually funding uh, some of this research rather than, in our case, the research councils, the results would dir go directly back into those ministries and could feed into policy in a way that they don't at the moment. Thank you. Very good point, and uh, we have the cert here at the table. Um, so whoever feels um, they wish to respond to the funding uh, plea already right now, um, otherwise uh, we can wait for the ministers. I think next one was Australia. Thank you, Timo. Um, I just wanted to reflect on the narrative opportunity for TCPs to bring to the ministers. I think there's three key opportunities um, that could be brought forward. I think the first one is about the collective contribution um, of your lifetime of TCP's work to where we are now. Um, the latest WIA report shows that there was a drop, or it was the 1.5 degree report, that the last time their modeling said that by in 2050, we still had 50% um, of the technologies that needed to be taken to commercial levels to achieve those outcomes. This time around, it's dropped down to, to only 30% need to be developed. That, that's a huge drop in a, in a three year window. And I think there's a really great opportunity for the TCPs here to be able to say, well, we've contributed to that drop. It's the direct result of the type of research and innovation that's been going on for the last kind of five years in this space. Um, so connect yourselves into those outcomes and um, don't let that just be because it happened. It didn't just happen. It's because of all the work that you've been doing. The second point then is around, um, again, the outcomes from the work um, and linking what your TCP focused technologies are um, into how they're contributing to those pathways forward, um, not just under the WIO, but also under the political agreements that have come out, either the, the G20, um, who also endorsed the tripling of renewables and doubling of energy efficiency goals, and we'll have COP28 between now and the ministerial in February. Um, so a chance to put forward the outcomes that your TCPs are working on, how they directly relate back to those big political agendas and that, that global goal that we are working towards. Um, it again gives you that opportunity to demonstrate what you have contributed, but also what you will contribute. Um, and then also just highlighting that importance of industry and, and academic research, just despite some of the policy landscapes that have shifted over the years. And um, I know a colleague earlier noted on some countries who have big changes in the political agenda. Um, your work has been a constant through those. Um, and then uh, just to the point that was just raised, use it as a chance to remind ministers why investing in R&D is important. Um, so if you can get those first two bits right, then it really helps with that point around funding. So asking, you're asking them how to fund it, tell them why um, and really take that opportunity. Thanks. That's a very good, I think that latter point resonates very strongly with me. Um, uh, believe me, it's easier to, I mean, you know that very well, um, to pitch for money when uh, um, you make, can make the case very easily on building on success stories, not on prospective success stories, but on achieved success stories. Um, energy efficiency and uh, energy efficient and use equipment, please. 
Thank you, Timor. Uh, regarding success stories, I want to shortly point out to the two reports in succession we did at 4E on the results from energy efficiency standards and labeling. Uh, they are available uh, and there you find direct uh, examples of uh, energy efficiency uh, standards and labeling for products uh, reducing energy consumption and also not making products uh, more expensive. So I think that is a very concrete example uh, from a TCP work. Uh, regarding uh, strategic, uh, say, guidance from the ministerial, I think uh, what several of the other speakers uh, have said, I think continuity and consistency is, is very important. Uh, and that is both in a kind of, uh, say, content guidance. And I think we have with the net zero, uh, say, energy system in uh, 2050, uh, we have that as a long-term goal, uh, but also in a funding uh, environment, uh, if budgets, as was said, uh, will vary a lot throughout the years, that will hamper much more uh, progress than if they are uh, stable. Uh, and another point, and that may be a bit of a paradox that we need to think about, is we're talking here about R&D uh, and technology. And we all know that that, you could say, is on the safe side of politics uh, because it doesn't interact too much with, uh, with the human, with society, uh, at least not uh, too much on a political level. But we also want, and that uh, is being seen in the IA also in the Secretariat, we also be, want to be policy relevant. And then we get into this policy cycle where things can shift uh, from one day to the other uh, and, and where there are multiple, uh, say, interests and where continuity and consistency is not as easy uh, to be conceived as purely on the R&D side. So attention to the kind of difference and, and the balance and the tension between, say, the technology, the pure technology and the R&D and more working into the, the policy cycle, uh, that would be very helpful. Very good point. I have four more um, on my list and we'll need to um, cut then, um, if that's okay, um, uh, because we are um, running very late now. Um, uh, high temperatures, superconductivity, heat, then district heating and cooling, then inter International Center for Sustainable Carbon and then the PBPS and then, um, yeah, so. So, um, and this is for the, your second questions about the messages that TCP want uh, to give to the ministerial. Uh, the energy transition as a, uh, already um, supposed to follow some strategy, also long, uh, medium and long-term strategies by the government. However, the implementation, uh, it's not clear in terms of technology in a very long term. I mean, uh, the message is uh, take into account also technology that uh, will reach maturity as high temperature superconductivity. For example, we developed a roadmap for each components and uh, take into account these technologies uh, in your plan of the developing and um, designing infrastructure, in this case, the power grid, because uh, this can influence, for example, uh, um, transmission system operator to consider this and also in a longer term uh, to influence investors uh, to to invest in this and to accelerate uh, this. Okay, thank you very much. District Heating and Cooling. Thank you. Um, just wanted to say a few words about um, what's been happening uh, with District Heating and Cooling. Uh, first, in 2023, we've seen uh, three new member countries join. Um, I would say as well that um, new member countries over the last um, few years have uh, been immediately keen to host um, EXCO meetings, to host our uh, biannual symposium. So they've come in with a great deal of enthusiasm. Uh, the whole thing that's been really happening is um, 
as an enabling in infrastructure, I believe, together with heat pumps and storage, we're looking at uh, systems with reduced supply temperatures, which enable us to uh, use more renewable sources, more renewable heat and available waste energy in our communities and address uh, the higher levels of energy efficiency in buildings, which mean that, um, uh, that the required loads are reduced. One um, uh, re very recent um, new report entitled Hybrid Energy Networks uh, highlights some of that, um, uh, those links. And it comes with a supplement um, called Resource Exergy. And I just wanted to make the point that I think uh, in terms of um, ongoing and forthcoming energy policy, that we need to take on board energy quality as well as energy quantity. Thank you. Good points. Now, the International Center for Sustainable Carbon. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that I feel a bit like the bad fairy at the christening as a representative of the ICSC, which was originally IA Coal Research. I understand that my TCP was actually the oldest as we came into being in 1975. And we published our first reports on climate change back in the 1980s years before the IPCC came into being. Our TCP is coming to an end in the next few years as the energy world has evolved, and that's good. But I am proud of much of what we've achieved. We've done excellent work on reducing the environmental impact of coal, and apologies for using a four letter word. We've published around 500 reports. We've done monthly webinars on YouTube for a decade, We've organized many workshops and conferences. We've worked on emissions reductions of CO2, SOX, NOx, and mercury. We've done uh, workshops and many reports on carbon capture and storage, co-firing with biomass, increasing efficiency, and water use and waste reduction. I understand that governments are reluctant to fund coal research based in London, and the world has changed. And that, that's all to the good. And, and our recent work has particularly been on integrating coal as a flexible base load to work with VRE. But I think everybody should also remember that Asia, where most people live, still relies on coal and it still provides about 30% of global electricity. Thank you. All good points. Thanks a lot now, uh, PVPS. Yes, thank you. Quick uh, suggestion maybe for the uh, ministerial meeting next year. Uh, the other day I took a look at the uh, Today in the Lab, Tomorrow in Energy page and uh, it could be a suggestion. I think there are many examples, there are over 50. Um, I was looking for a specific outcome of all the examples cited and um, most of them are on providing information, on uh, having demonstration project going on, etc. So it's not really on very tangible outcome on the market. And it could be an idea to, because the pages date from 2020, it, so they're already two, three years old. It could be maybe an idea to, to come up with a Today in the Lab 2.0 where um, you kind of single out maybe the 10 most important uh, projects that really have come up with tangible results. So backcasting a little bit and see what really has come out of them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are running really against the time. And I know that EU has, not, has raised the flag heat pumping technologies wanted to talk to. And now I'm also seeing, um, I can't see it, but um, I'm, <laughs> uh, it's can, no, no, what, what is it? Ah, solar heating and cooling. If you can keep it very short and sweet, then we um, do these um, three rounds. I don't know if you wanted to talk or not. Yes, yeah. Thank you. For the messages for the ministers, uh, we have a certain worry about uh, the cost of the transition towards the people. Uh, it's not only users, but the, the clean energy transition will impact a lot, a lot the life, the usual life of people. So maybe a message could be that to ask the IEA to look at that, to monitor it and not limit to users, but limit to the impact of all the technologies. And secondly, that this care about the impact on the normal life and the people is embedded in the research on technology. 
because we cannot be innocent and not seeing the impact of what we do as the researchers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did you want to come in or not? Yes. Yes, please. So time to make it short. So I just would like to comment on the first questions of strategic guidance on NG technology R&D. And uh, so in our vision of the HPT TCP, we have written that heat pumping technologies are the cornerstone for the secure, affordable, high efficient, clean and net zero emission energy system. I guess we have a lot of other cornerstones here around. And for this, I think it's very important. That's my message to the minister that uh, we are aware that we have to develop different technologies for an integrated energy system. That it is always what you have to think behind to to coordinate, to collaborate, and to integrate the energy systems in the future. And it's not a super technology and other technologies we are in the situation where we have to develop all different technologies and all the technologies should have a chance to contribute to this integrated energy system. Thanks. Very good points. Now, um, solar heating and cooling. Very short question. Um, is there a timeline for detailed contributions from the TCPs and what detailed? That so it's an excellent question and I'm not sure that, I mean, the timeline, we have the meeting at 13th and 14th of uh, uh, February on the 13th, that will be the Energy Innovation Forum. And I would really like to, I mean, I really hate to cut um, the um, discussion now because it's actually uh, going into a very good um, dynamics, I think. And um, I'm sure, you know, the more that you think about it, the more ideas will come up. Um, so please do send us suggestions. Um, I would say, I'm not sure if I'm going out of my way here to say we can still keep the month of uh, November for uh, for input. No, send us written ideas. Um, this is about what you need from the governments, no, what you hope that should come out of the uh, ministerial meeting, but it's also very much, believe me, very much how important this is. Don't I, I said in the beginning when I presented some of our work on, you know, the um, the share of you know, uh, technologies not yet in the market to reach net zero emissions or the importance of international collaboration. It is very important um, to be concrete. Where have we driven change? You know, what, has, uh, what have we done? Why was that a successful story? I very much like what Brian said about um, the ITSAP you know, and the modeling. Um, everyone knows models now, but um, does everyone know where this is coming from? I'm not sure. And I think this is you know, very important to highlight. It's very concrete, it's very detailed, it's very... Um, it's going to convince everyone immediately. So um, it's not about every report we have written. It's not about every uh, contribution that we have made, uh, every um, meeting that we have held. It's about two, three key examples where you think that your TCP has driven change alone or with others, etc. It doesn't matter because you're whatever. If you have a concrete example, you will help the others too. So um, this is what uh, what we are after here. Is not about showcasing everyone and everything, but it's about finding a couple of things that um, make uh, um, high-level people who have no time to go into every single detail of what we are doing um, aware this is obviously important and this was obviously a good thing um, that uh, has happened. So any example here will be appreciated um, uh, from that perspective. And now, thank you, Paolo, for your patience and waiting for um, uh, holding over to you as the Secretary of the um, uh, Renewable Energy Technology Working Group and the Head of the Renewable Energy Division. Thank you, Timur, and I'm conscious that I'm the last obstacle before lunch. Now, still, I will try to, in five minutes, to explain why, in my opinion, the TCP story is not just a positive story, but it's just a key pillar of overall IA activities seen from a renewable perspective. And I want to elaborate this on the past, on the present, and on the future. Now, allow me two words on the past. The TCPs, I have two in mind, are much older than the Renewable Energy Unit. Actually, the Renewable Energy Unit was founded in 1999 to support the Renewable Working Party, which was much older. And it was literally a unit at that time, one person, Rick Sellers. Mm -hmm. Then more person came, including on my left, uh, Timur. Then he left and I came as a unit head. Today, we are 17 as a Renewable Energy Division with the renewable integration and system security, it's the double, and renewables are mainstream everywhere in all the activities of the IA. I tell you very clearly, without your help, we will not be here in this 
strength on renewables. And from the past, let me mention two uh, examples, uh, the season of the roadmaps that you also recall very well. I will mention only two. One is the hydropower roadmap with the hydropower TCP and Brazil, a crucial milestone in our relations with Brazil. The second is with PVPS, the two roadmaps on solar, we were the first in the world saying back in 2014 that solar could become the largest source of electricity in the world at that time. Of course, we were wrong because it went much faster than we had in the roadmap, but, but still the message was there. In the recent past and in the present, I want to mention just a few other examples that really excuse me for not, uh, I cannot thank you all. Task 25 of wind, super important in setting up all the system integration work in this agency for variable renewables. PV on manufacturing and sustainability in recent times and now working both with Timor and, and us. The IA Bioenergy TCP supporting the BioFuture platform now getting at the G20 attention level. And of course, hydrogen in many circumstances, substantiating both my division and the whole uh, ETP division. I could make a much longer list, I cannot, I don't have the time. Now for the future, I would like to emphasize three points which were actually touched on some of you. First, the importance of more system orientation and communication and collaboration between yourselves. And I emphasize this for two main reasons. The first, is because more and more we have energy system issues and not just silos, technology. You are all aware that even if you are very much in love with your own technology, it will not solve it the, the whole thing alone. Second, because when going to speak with the ministers and the national governments, the more you are coordinating When proposing uh, national coordination in, at national level and also coordination among the different TCPs. At national level, some of the countries, and this is our call for the governments now, not for the TCPs, make very effective national TCP days, which are a phenomenal way to highlight the importance of all TCPs, or let's say most of TCPs, for the country. This has been proven by experience a very important one. And my last point for the future is how important TCPs are in our engagement with non-member countries. Non-member countries can participate in your activities straight on. They don't have the bureaucratic, some of the bureaucratic hampering things that we have in the Secretariat. And some of your TCPs are really phenomenal, at least in the field of renewables, but I'm sure it is also true uh, to engage with these countries, which is where the most of the energy demand growth will be in the future. Now, my last point is on the ROOP. Alors, first of all, I welcome the, the third decision to expand the uh, scope of the ROOP into, and we're looking forward, uh, welcoming ISGAN, energy storage, but also HTS um, in, in under our remits. I speak now as a secretary of Renewable Working Party. Uh, the chair of the group, Alejandro Moreno, is very sensitive on electricity security system orientation. And here I can only add a personal anecdote to you, HTES. I'm a semiconductor physicist by background, but in my laboratory at that time, it was the first laboratory in Italy looking at high temperature superconductivity. So I will be very happy and curious to listen to you. And of course, I'm very, uh, um, how can I say, sensitive on what this can bring as storage means and uh, for nuclear fusion uh, later, later way. Now, uh, the next ROOP meeting will be a very special one because it's in India. It's the first time ever we do a ROOP meeting in India. And here, once to respond to some of your observation, please use the working parties as the first level to bring your communication from the technology to the policy sensitivity. The strategic discussion item on this group meeting will be how to triple renewables by 2030. It will also discuss the current struggles of the wind industry. I can only thank all the TCPs for being so active in the group, but I stress that the working parties are the first level 
where you can bring the attention of your I'm finished uh, Timor that you can bring the uh, the uh, your to, to attention of the policymakers through us through the working parties and through the secretariat and here I really uh, uh, close I thank you chair thank you Timor uh, thank you pair for giving the word we have always collaborated, but we will continue to collaborate even more strongly across the agency to make sure that the exceptional good work that you all TCPs do is reflected in our analysis and then ultimately through us goes to the attention to the policymakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paolo, and um, pretty much on time, to be honest, so yeah, well done. Nice. Um, uh, slightly, I mean, slightly long, but doesn't matter. <laughs> it's not number checking here. So. Um, uh, thanks for this encouraging session, um, for all the feedback. Again, um, don't hesitate to reach out to us after this um, session. Um, you have time, not much, but there is time um, to provide us with input. Uh, we really want to make um, sure that we use the ministerial in a good way, um, good way for you, good way for us, and good way for our member governments, so that um, people understand the value of international collaboration on RD&D, regardless the technology, regardless of um, uh, the type of area that you're into, and um, that we can uh, build upon uh, hopefully improved and refi further refined mandate um, for us as an agency and you as the TCPs moving forward. With that, we're now going to take a um, family photo. I understand if the uh, photographer is there. I don't know. Is it? Yeah, okay, good. Um, the idea is to all gather on this side of the room in two, uh, two rows. Um, obviously, the general principle apply. The larger you are, the further back you stand. Um, <laughs> and um, we're going to take a um, picture here, and then uh, we're going to serve lunch uh, outside, um, outside the room. And then we will reconvene at 2 o'clock. Um, so uh, thank you very much. Bye. So, if you could come over, that'd be great.
Sam, can you use the mic? Because I, I think, I don't think we can hear you, but we understood the concept of squeezing <laughs> together. <laughs>
tester ça. Test en Connection failed. Power off. No phone is connected. Connecting. Eh, si. Eh.
All right, everyone, welcome back. Hope you uh, had a chance to enjoy lunch, have some conversation, make some connections. Um, let's get started with our afternoon session. Uh, before doing so, I'd like to say uh, I really appreciated uh, all of the participation and the interventions uh, throughout both morning sessions. And despite the, uh, the unplanned fire drill, I think uh, we, uh, we had a really successful morning. So thank you for that. And let's continue the trend this afternoon. Um, so uh, we have been focusing uh, so far, wait, I'm reading the wrong notes. Now I know what I'm talking about. Sorry about that. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the areas that the CERT review identified as uh, key to the way that we operate going forward uh, is about communications. So uh, we're going to spend the whole afternoon on this topic. Um, I think that it's actually really important that we do so. Uh, we're going to be focusing on both the internal aspect of communications, that is to say, uh, between TCPs and within uh, the broader uh, network that we have, um, and then we will turn and uh, talk about external facing uh, communications. I'm going to hand it over to Per, who's going to run us through how the next uh, hour or so is going to work. Uh, so Per, over to you. Thank you very much, Amanda, and uh, good afternoon uh, to all of you. Uh, as well, for me, it's great to see so many of you here today, uh, and of course, the ones that I've been having a chance to talk to over the last nine months as well, uh, linked to the CERT review. I want to take the, the chance to also to thank you uh, for all the input. Um, and again, I think this morning session definitely showed us as well. There's lots of ideas of how to uh, make uh, steps forward as well uh, to ensure that the, the work we're doing under the technology collaboration program continues to be very valuable uh, for governments. Uh, I mean, there are many aspects and what we uh, will discuss now is indeed the communicational aspects which came up uh, this morning as well. And then uh, tomorrow we'll focus on the TCP coordination groups and the request for extension. These are of course linked to each other, but uh, as Amanda said, uh, we wanna focus now on the different aspects uh, linked to uh, internal and external communication. So this uh, in many ways came up as uh, one area uh, where uh, many thought they needed improvement and it comes back to the basic questions that we do here from now on, uh, every now and then in by CERT delegates, uh, asking us to come up with better ideas, uh, ways to communicate the work of the TCPs. Uh, I've been here for almost five years and this is a question that we, we have tried to different approaches to by one pagers, by newsletters, by today in the lab, tomorrow in energy that we mentioned. But here again, uh, we wanna use the next uh, uh, month or so, uh, starting of course with today's session to continue brainstorming what can we from the IA Secretariat do uh, to improve the communication of the TCP work as an example. But it also comes up in other ways where uh, TCPs, both uh, ex-co members, chairs, secretaries, but we also expect maybe uh, other colleagues involved in the TCPs are asking questions about well, who is in CERT, uh, what are CERT doing, what are the working parties doing, so again, a, a good example of a communication gap. And this has been addressed by many of the CERT delegates in the interviews as well. And this is uh, therefore something that the CERT delegates have decided to address uh, through the CERT review. Uh, what, we, uh, what we also would, and maybe not so much for this session, but it's also linked to some of the, the things that Paolo Frankel said before lunch, it's also important to find uh, better ways to have conversations between CERT and the working parties. And again, and CERT at the working parties can also be a, a platform through the, where the TCP can also reach out and, and find ways to both coordinate, but also communicate their activities. So uh, take, it takes me to the first session. Uh, oh, wrong button. So in the first part, indeed, uh, what you have received as all in the material uh, for this meeting, is uh, what we call Annex 5, which basically lists uh, what could government officials through CERT and the working party do better on their side to communicate the work of the TCPs, uh, what can the TCPs do themselves, and what can the IE Secretariat to help. So this is the part, uh, purpose of, of session two. And then on session three, uh, we focus on best practices for uh, external communication uh, to discuss and be inspired by the work done. And many thanks to Adem uh, and the colleagues that have been involved in this project to really look at uh, best practices for communication. And thanks for the TCPs that have also been involved uh, in uh, that process to develop that report. Uh, just, and I'll come back to this as well, uh, but today will be in a way a starting point. And that was also to quote some of the colleagues in CERT yesterday when we discussed the review. 
Uh, this is by no far uh, coming to an end. Uh, what we've done so far helps us to get started on many of these uh, discussions. And that's why we want to start now with a conversation here this afternoon. But seeking uh, uh, come up with a proposal working with all of you uh, to the CERT meeting, uh, the first one next year, which is in March, uh, which a number of proposals that can be uh, approved and adopted uh, by the CERT. By no means, uh, that will be the end of discussions on communication, but uh, at least we hope that this will help to uh, take a few steps forward. Uh, as was said by a colleague yesterday, it's always hard to just aim for perfection, but at least you move forward to make sure that you, you so seek some concrete improvements, both what governments can do, what CCPs can do, what the Secretariat can do. So uh, just uh, we will soon uh, break up in, uh, in, in breakout uh, discussions. And uh, the clear objective, as I said, and I will soon run through very quickly the different uh, the lists I mentioned. But it's again for you, uh, both CERT delegates, uh, working party representatives, TCPs, and IE Secretariat colleagues, to review the list uh, of what each one can do. Uh, and then, uh, if there are potential activities missing, uh, we are asked the note takers to note those down, but also for the moderators to see are any of these activities listed that are particular of particular importance. And then we will ask you to make those in bold. So the questions uh, is, you know, again, what uh, is your view on these proposals? Anything missing? Uh, what is the priority uh, for governments, TCPs and the secretariat? Uh, and what can we, uh, governments and IE Secretariat, further support uh, TCPs in promoting their work? So that takes me to uh, the first area, which uh, we have been uh, coming to, uh, or we have heard in, in, in a number of interventions today. Uh, so what can CERT and working party delegates do? Uh, we have heard this uh, proposal or mentioning as well of the value of the, the national TCP days as a way to gather the TCPs to discuss uh, both uh, priorities of the government, but also uh, have a chance to, to have cross-TCP cross, cross learnings uh, from delegates, building that national community as well among the TCPs. And uh, if it makes sense, uh, also, of course, involving other organizations or, or sorry, representatives uh, from your country that participate in initiatives under, let's say, Clean Energy Ministerial, Mission Innovation, or other platforms. But also uh, to... Uh, identify a national TCP uh, coordinator, of course, to help with these activities, but it could also be a focal point, both from us, from the Secretariat, but also from a national uh, research institute. Of course, uh, the third delegate is in a way overseeing the TCP participation, but uh, often uh, quite a senior person could also be identified as uh, someone who's can be have a more dysfunctioned role to also be the, the go-to person uh, to get with the third delegate in the country on any TCP matters to, to strengthen the home organization or the organization in uh, the countries uh, for the TCP participation. Then a few other things here that you will see in the list, uh, but I'll just in the sake of time, you will have those in the files that you have received for the meeting uh, and you can go through them at the meeting tell, uh, in the breakouts as well. But just coming to the next uh, pillar or the next area of, um, uh, of which is TCPs. Uh, here again, of course, there is uh, long-standing activities where TCPs are reporting their activities to uh, the working parties in CERT uh, through the annual written briefing. There's no intention here, of course, to add any briefing, but we'd rather see if we can, if this, uh, the way uh, the communication is today, uh, fulfill the expectations uh, from uh, CERT delegates, but also more in general, government officials, uh, trying to understand what our TCP is doing. Uh, we also know and understand that the process is quite, different from different how different working parties are operating this. So also taking some time from now until the March meeting to review uh, how the opportunities for streamlining some of these activities further. Then coming to, and for the breakouts, uh, again, it would be great to have a discussion about the, the list here, of course, when we're talking about what TCP can be doing, but I, I think we in particular want uh, CERT delegates to use this opportunity as well uh, to let the TCPs and us know what kind of information you value in particular uh, coming from the TCPs. Then uh, when it comes to the secretary, the longest list, uh, but again, we're saying here, uh, this is just a starting list. It doesn't mean that all these activities will uh, be uh, selected in the end. We're trying to see how we can make things uh, in a way with the resources we have and which are most useful. So of course, uh, when we're asking the, the uh, colleagues around the table, what can we further do to help uh, in coordination 
information sharing between the TCPs. Uh, we understand this is an important task for us and here from now until the March meeting, we do spend a bit more time thinking how we can use the Delegates Hub for regularly updating even costs for this potential area network exchange. I also would like to mention that, as was mentioned today in the lab, uh, this uh, early today, or as I said just now, it's the many way for us to find ways to communicate the great work of the TCPs. The question is, how can we find a, an approach that is uh, sustainable over time, that suits uh, the different uh, features of the different TCPs, knowing that you are very different in the way you operate, what type of activities you have. Some, of course, uh, have uh, amazing conferences where you bring together the world expertise around your sectors or technologies. Others are working uh, very closely in processes linked to policy development, building codes, uh, uh, while others, of course, provide uh, insightful research. Or as we heard this morning as well, for many of you are certainly the go-to places when you have any questions about uh, a certain technology. But again, what's the best format for us uh, to think about how we can share that as well uh, in our external communication, if it's through web, our website, through newsletters or any other communication, and here we also uh, now will be in a brainstorming phase from now on until the, the March meeting. So this is, you have all this, again, this list in your, uh, in uh, in the material that we send out before the meeting, uh, the, the note takers or the moderators and note takers will also have this template. So you, in the breakout groups, you will go them list by list. And again, uh, it's very important for us uh, to get your feedback on the list and if something is missing or what's important. Uh, and, uh, See, and yes, I'll come to this one. Let's see if I. So I think that's um, them coming to the to trickiest part, which is uh, since we are quite a few, uh, we're testing now our facilities to organize breakout groups with uh, around uh, eighty to hundred people. Uh, we have uh, five breakout groups in total. I will go through them slowly so you can try to find your names. So this is room one, uh, room two is downstairs. Uh, and then we'll be in two other rooms, uh, and, but I'll in a moment point to uh, my colleagues who will guide you uh, to the room. If you don't find your name, uh, as I go through the slides, there will also on the doors, there's some uh, here in the back too. Uh, we can try to find which room you should be in. But everyone who's done in the first, on the left side here, you can stay here and you will be with uh, Luca will moderate and together with my colleague Shane who will take the notes uh, and then uh, for the colleagues here on the right uh, you have uh, Simona who will moderate uh, you will go downstairs uh, just uh, right of the entrance uh, you can follow my colleague Casey Michaels who of course many of you know uh, going down to that room then coming to the other breakup group three so uh, you will go to uh, room uh, 0108 which is also on the ground floor where you arrive where you're by the entrance here it will be Christoph from Germany who will moderate and my colleague Joyce. There's Christoph, Joyce. So you can follow her down to that room. Uh, for group four, uh, you will be in room uh, 4104, which is you take the elevator or the, uh, the, the stairs. Uh, maybe the stairs uh, follow a tail. Who is here? Uh, which is on the fourth floor. And then to the last group. Uh, which is uh, one floor down, of one floor up, sorry. Uh, and here we have Anne-Marie from Ireland. Uh, so we are there. Who will walk together with Jules, who is there. <laughs> uh, and again, if you didn't find your name, uh, have a quick look at the lists. Uh, this has been a slightly challenged exercise with late registration, so you don't find your name. We suggest as well uh, that you stay in this room uh, to join this uh, this breakout group. Yeah, sorry. And for people online, uh, we had intention of having a, a, a virtual group as well. Uh, in then we see there is relatively few people joining online, so that's why we recommend that uh, if those colleagues uh, they can actually stay in this room. But otherwise, if uh, we, they can also send their written uh, feedback, if it's difficult to follow uh, the discussions that will be uh, taking place in this room. All right, thank you, Pear. Any um, questions uh, before we break off into our separate groups? 
everyone understands the assignment. Wonderful. Maybe you should say something about when being back. Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> please come back. Please come back. <laughs> and please come back. Uh, I think we have a break at 3.30, right? Are That's going... correct. So 3.30 is uh, another coffee break. Uh, so when you finish, the moder moderators feel like the discussions has come to a point where it's time for a break. Uh, please then move into the coffee break, which will again be outside here. And then we start here again at four o'clock with the, the session on uh, uh, external communication. Thank you. Thank you. Hello everyone in group one. My name is Luca and I ask you to, to move to this corner so that we're a little bit closer together. Thanks.
Hello and welcome everybody to this uh, breakout session. My name is Luca Castiglioni. I'm the uh, vice chair of the End Use Technologies Working Party and I'm trying to moderate this session. Shane is helping me with taking notes and having all the online users with us as well. Do you want to say something, Shane? Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, I mean, this is the core also of the of the meeting that we're having today that uh, the third was discussing yesterday is how to enhance the communication in between the TCPs, between the TCPs at the working parties and the third, and also between the member countries. And this is, as we all know, a very difficult task and a tedious task, resource consuming task. So we'll try to find out how this can be enhanced uh, a little bit. I think we are already moving to slide number two. I think we're already on slide two. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> we're very fast. So like what's the, um, the, the purpose or the objective um, is to review the search uh, list of proposals for how uh, involved her third TCP and the IE secretariat may prioritize activities over the next years to improve communication of the TCP work. And we will respond to these questions as we go through and review the suggested activities of what government officials, IEA secretariat and TCPs could do. We have around 15 minutes to discuss per category. So we'll try to keep track of that. Um, so to start with, what is your view of the proposal? Is anything essential missing? What should be the priority actions for the government's TCPs and the IEA secretariat? So the, these are the, and the second question is how can governments and the IEA secretariat further support TCPs in promoting their work? So I think uh, we can start with question one. I hope everyone is familiar with the uh, proposal and I'm um, happy to open the discussion. Maybe I can just start with a relatively simple question. I think I think one one part of the proposal is that there should be annual briefings to the third, and um, I'm just wondering how this is related to the annual briefs that we provide to the, Re the renewable energy working party. Um, would this be the same format, or would something substitute the other thing to just streamline efforts and information templates? I think this would be something to maybe clarify in the further process. I think I think it's a good question. It also depends on the TCP. Some TCPs report directly to the CERT, and other TCPs basically report via working parties. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I think it is clear for for both the IA Secretariat and all the TCPs that we want to have a very efficient and uh, streamlined process. I mean, it's always about reporting what is the minimum required, what it, what is important, and so on. And I think this is uh, key. Yes. Mm hmm. Maybe one suggestion would be to use those uh, annual briefings as a source of information um, so uh, to make the best use of it. So distilling uh, key highlights from the TCPs, uh, featuring them in a report, it could be annual since it's an annual reporting, uh, and possibly then, which would not be uh, that easy, distilling kind of high level messages from a system perspective. So really showing how all the TCPs are working on different technologies, but then how, and somebody from, I guess the IA secretary would have to do that uh, without necessarily having to be democratic and picking up on every TCP and every, but like try to bring together some key messages that emerge that are like a system level. Yeah, look, I think the, in general, the ID is uh, is good if it's one, say, a briefing or a report uh, that each TCP has to be has to make. So, uh, and <clears throat> then if you want to use that for both the end use working party, the secretariat, and and the cert, 
uh, then you might in the template want indeed to uh, to distinguish a bit. Uh, I think the the high level uh, information is more for the cert uh, and the details uh, may be more for the secretariat and the end use working party. Uh, and I guess it would be uh, less of a burden for the secretariat if the, the template and the kind of instructions would be as clear as possible, because otherwise uh, I indeed think that those reports will contain a lot of information and that you can extract a lot of uh, things out of it, but that also will cost resources. So the much, uh, say, pre uh, prepared and, and with a template, the, the more that is the, the more easier it's also for the secretariat to process and to give the right information to the right level. I mean, I mean, I mean. I think uh, templates are, of course, already in place. But I mean, I think what you suggest is also to have a target group oriented or structured uh, report. So you have like a high level policy brief, basically, where with the key highlights, and then you have all the administrative information about the TCPs. Plus, maybe in addition, you have a level where you want to communicate also to other TCPs. Yes, but please, in the same report. So that not a TCP has to make a report for the third and a second for the secretariat and a third for other TCPs. And, and then the template will guide TCPs. Okay, these headlines, they will be cut out for the third. So please only headlines. And so for very, I think that need not be too detailed, but some guidance on the, on the levels and where the information goes to will, uh, will help. But please one report, not three. I can uh, say confidently on behalf of CERT that uh, we would want there to be a consolidated uh, reporting structure, yes. I think the, um, it, in parallel with the uh, TCPs providing a, an annual report of activities, which is kind of, I presume we're talking about some summary in short, it would be similarly useful to get something from the working parties and CERT that can be shared with the TCPs. Because um, I'm conscious that the the information flow, and it comes true in some of the feedback, the information flow is seen as one way. Um, and I think the TCPs would probably um, engage better with CERT and the working parties if they had a better understanding of, of what, what their role is, what they do. Um, and, um, and again, I'm not talking about additional work because I presume there's some kind of reporting that's been done anyway for, uh, by the working parties and, 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 and CERT, but some summary version of that that can be shared. Because uh, I think these, these, and it builds on what's been said, these reports can be used for multiple purposes because it also is a way, of course, then of, of, of showing the value of the, the IA work and the, 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 um, the, the CERT, the TCPs, et cetera. So it can be used for different, different um, dissemination means. Um, but certainly, I, I think a, 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 a version of, of, a, of a summary that's, um, that's made available to the TCPs would just help in terms of this two-way flow information thanks yes i i think that's a very uh, valuable uh, remark because i mean we we ask about how to to align what is being done in the tcps with priorities of uh, member countries and the ce uh, and cert and this is difficult to achieve if you don't have this kind of bi-directional uh, information flow and uh, yes i mean maybe we hear some uh, other third delegates, uh, what they think about that. Mm -hmm. Try again. Um, actually, just to bring a slightly different um, perspective, uh, because I'm not as familiar on some of the internal um, communication things, but I think one of the priorities that we could be working towards is building the uh, profile of the work of the CERT um, outside the direct kind of research areas and outside of this kind of group of people. Um, but also wanted to recognize that 
the um, the proposals are, are great and we think all of these things will, will certainly help us on our way, but they will take resourcing. Um, so I think it is really important that we work out how to do this with the least impact um, on the people power, but then also work out which parts of them are really going to need some dedicated funding um, towards as well, just to consider that. Um, and just with my hat on that works in mission innovation and the clean energy ministerial as well, uh, maybe thinking about a way of being more um, structured in how TCPs meet and interact with those missions and initiatives that are also doing work, um, either it be a regular part of your meetings um, or making sure that like if you're not already attending the SEM MI ministerials each year um, that you do because it's that really great convening moment um, that's just a couple of thoughts on the external side. Um, maybe it's a little controversial, but I was thinking, I was struck this morning by the fact because we have a direct exchange with the third delegate, it's the first time. And um, I was struck by the fact that um, some, de some third delegate are not very aware of what is inside the TCP, what is the, the work. And I was thinking about the structure to have three, three layers, working party, uh, CERT, and no, TCP, working party, and CERT. And I think there is some drawbacks because, um, because the fact that we have an intermediate layer is something very heavy, you know? <laughs> and um, and um, I don't know if the one solution could be that the delegate in the working party will be the same as the CERT. Because in this case, you, the knowledge is, is, is easy to, to, to share. But uh, generally speaking, I don't know for countries, but for France, it's different people. They are not very motivated uh, for that. And uh, the result is that there is no transmission of information to, towards the third. So I, I speak about internal communication. And if you add the fact that you ha we have many external initiatives, like you say, because uh, in the right of field, we have 20 initiatives, more than 20. And, uh, and uh, the fact that uh, it's different people in the mission innovation, in the same, in the, in the clean, uh, in the over IPHC, et cetera, at the end, the information is not going well through this different. So at least we, we need to have at the IEA level a very simple structure, I think, because we have too much things outside and uh, of course i will speak later on the on the link between uh, tcp and mission innovation because mission innovation is more focused on r and but it's another topic but uh, i just wonder how we can improve the structure of course we can think about uh, why we need a working party <laughs> maybe we put on the table but uh, okay i think it's a one one uh, one thing we have to 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 think about uh, because for me it's a, it's a harder I, th Sorry. I think it's an important comment because, I mean, of, of, of course, the structure with the levels of TCP working parties and the CERT, the, the idea of the uh, working parties is to, to facilitate the, uh, the work of CERT and to help and support and even like support the communication. But it's, it's true what you say, like in particular, ideally, it could be that it's the same delegates. It's not the case for my country either. And it's difficult to have delegates for all the working parties and uh, motivate them. And then it turns out that it actually turns into a bottleneck of information flow instead of uh, facilitating the information flow. So, sorry, uh, I forgot something. And just another drawback is that uh... You have some silos, renewable, etc. And I know for hydrogen, I, I speak this morning that uh, I, I am not only renewable. And uh, so to have no, uh, to have only one one body will facilitate the, because we can speak about with all TCP and to the cert also. It's another another drawback. Sure. So I'm. Thanks for that. I, I think those. That's really valuable. And I think uh, you've probably surfaced a lot of the things that uh, Pear and the task force uh, heard in the course of uh, doing the interviews uh, and the research uh, for the review. Uh, certainly on the um, on the working parties, I think that's that's something uh, that has been heard very clearly is uh, wanting to make it less of 
sort of an administrative uh, layer and make it something more value add. So I think as a first step, uh, some of the principles uh, that CERT adopted uh, yesterday, I think we are hopeful uh, that they will help. They're not gonna fix everything. Um, on the, the, the issue of, of common reps, um, I think it's going to depend on uh, national governments and the way that uh, they are structured. Certainly, I know it would be very difficult uh, to have one person sort of in in my office, for example, who's attending CERT and all of the working party meetings, you know, being in Canada and we're not an international um office. We are the office that coordinates R&D uh, for energy in Canada. So uh, trying to, to do all of that with one person would probably actually lead uh, to the opposite of what, what you're hoping to get. But I, I think that it does depend on uh, national structures and uh, that might work well for some versus others. But I think that there might be more stu structural or process-based, uh, I, I know you're talking to get away from process, so I don't mean this in a bad way, but uh, more practices that we can adopt that will help to, to address some of these things. But I think just hearing about how they are issues is super helpful. Uh, on the broader international initiatives, all I can say is uh, I know that uh, your area in particular uh, has, has suffered. I think it's something we, all of us who have worked in the international space uh, have uh, lamented, I think, at various times, uh, the the uh, emergence of, of new initiatives sometimes um, seemingly disconnected or not as connected as they could be uh, to other things. Um, I think that's why, at least with some of the, the main initiatives that are going on, I mean, Peta mentioned uh, Mission Innovation and, uh, and Clean Energy Ministerial. I think there are probably a, a couple of others that often come up in this context. But I think those of us involved in this space, if we can just keep trying to make those connections and keep trying to explain why it's necessary to be complementary. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I know I'm, I'm preaching to the choir, Paul, <laughs> but uh, for what it's worth, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Well, I mean, thanks for the input and also a little bit in the sake of time. I would already direct to the second question, which is also very much related to that, like how can governments and the secretariat to support the TCPs in promoting their work. And it's not just promoting their work, but probably communication in general and exactly making TCPs uh, inform them about other initiatives and things that are going on. What are your expectations there? Uh, thanks. Two reflections on this, building on, on uh, things that have, have come up. Um, first reflection is, I, I think it's very positive to see the, the, the statements around, particularly in Mission Innovation and Clean Energy Ministerial. I, I do remember, I don't know if it was one of the early TCP gatherings, but I mentioned work we were doing on one of the Clean Energy Ministerial initiatives, and I was asked why we weren't doing more engagement with other TCPs, which was a valid question, but it, it, it kind of... Uh, showed an, an insular perspective that, that seems to have, have, have moved on. Uh, but I do think, I mean, we, we, we do support one of the clean energy ministerial uh, initiatives on long-term energy scenarios, but it's probably a lesser known part of what we do. So I, I do think this is where the Secretariat could help in terms of mapping the, because uh, I'm certainly not aware of, of the, the various TCP engagements with the different mission innovation and clean energy ministerial uh, initiatives. So I think that that mapping would be a would be a suggestion. Um, the, the the second point relates to um, this question of of um, this this national um, kind of harmonize not harmonization but communication flows or synergies across what what we're doing. And I think the first proposed thing this identification of a national TCP network coordinator. I presume it's in each country can help to to um, at least provide uh, um, some sense of um, coherence or at least an information gathering perspective on on that in terms of again to have a sense so that TCPs and CERT and the working groups have have one point of contact in countries if that's what the purpose of that person is uh, have one point of contact where they can actually find out uh, about the different uh, threads of uh, uh, a country or working party uh, um, engagement with, with the TCPs. 
Um, and finally, the, the, there's another, uh, just a small point on one of the um, proposals. It says organise TCP National Days, bringing together all the national TCP representatives, which is a great idea. Uh, we had one in Ireland in 2018. Uh, it was very useful. But that was organised. There's no time frame given. Is, is it, you know, I think it would be uh, improved by having a, a kind of a, a target time frame. Is it annual? Is it every two years? Because... Uh, effectively we've done one so we've organized that uh, we've ticked that box but it was in 2018 we could do it another one and so just uh, suggest a, a time frame be put on that recommendation thank you um yeah just a couple of thoughts uh, from here too uh, one is about reporting and uh, i i used to read a lot of reports from uh, eu funded uh, projects and and this is not always fun. No? <laughs> so it's, uh, the reports are not making the trick themselves. Uh, when they are too short, they are not necessarily interesting. And when they are too long, then it's difficult to read them and uh, and, and catching kind of the, the essence uh, from those. So, so you know, I have, I have, I'm double hearted about this, <laughs> this more reporting, especially knowing that some of the TCPs do struggle with the administration side of the of, of running the TCPs. TCPs require a lot of administration. I attended a few weeks ago the, the ISGAN uh, TC, uh, EXCO meeting. I mean, terrible, really, <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the sense it was three days of admin talk, basically. Uh, we we uh, not always uh, do. Um, uh, you, you know, even in the in, even with commission standard, <laughs> it's 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 a lot of uh, budget administration and the communication. And and interestingly, communication has been one of the most controversial thing. That it is just understaffed. Uh, people, um, there is one person who was hired to do that, and he was overloaded and and exhausted and <clears throat> and uh, on, on on the merge of breakdown basically. So it's. It's not. Uh, it is not so so easy to to to, so, to solve this issue. Uh, I would. I wanted to play and kind of take up uh, Paolo Frankel's uh, point from from the previous session when he said that use the working parties. Uh, he invited the TCPs. Use the working parties as your channel, as your gateway to 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 put forward your findings and your messages uh, towards the third. Because with the, my experience with the third is that. You know the profile of the delegates is vary a lot, and and uh, you know the work coming from the TCPs is is very technical. It's very sector based, and the delegates won't be able to reflect that variety of, of topics that uh, that do come from the direction of the TCPs. They won't appreciate. They may appreciate those their heart and their experience closer to, and they will ignore uh, the rest. So the 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 working parties are quite well placed if they work well. To, to kind of to articulate the information coming from the TCPs and and formulate them in a way that is relevant uh, for, for for the for the third and um, and maybe a last point that relates also to the to the second part the, to the second question is that uh, if the IE could uh, kind of track the the input the references the contributions uh, coming from the TCPs used in the IE products and reports and because uh, I, I understand that they are being used, uh, the IE desk officers are in contact with the with the TCPs. They do pick up some of the literature that the, that the TCPs produce. But if that could be tracked, if that could be also reported and follow up uh, towards the third, that would be kind of a demonstration. Because what what we very often in the ministries, I guess, mm -hmm. and the, the governments, we do read the IE, IE reports. Because you have the IE stem there, it's kind of a quality assurance. But if you can see that what is the TCP contribution to those, that would be, I think, a, a great value added. Thanks. Maybe one last comment, yes. Uh, first, maybe a general remark on the guidelines, and it was triggered by the remark of my neighbor uh, that, uh, say, organized national TCPs days is not uh, not so specified. I would be very cautious with further specifying these guidelines because then you come into a kind of legal text and I don't think this is meant to be a legal text but a guideline yeah. and a stimulus for uh, all the, uh, say, the addressees to take action. Uh, what you can do, of course, is monitoring how these guidelines have been played out. And if you then see that in, in three years' time, 
uh, say all TCPs uh, have maybe uh, zero because they did it already in 2018 or organized one TCP day, uh, that might then be a reason for, uh, for further action. But uh, as a start, don't try to make a legal document out of this. That I think will uh, work counterproductive. And the second point is the structure. Uh, I indeed think also that the working parties uh, can be very useful, uh, but then especially in their administrative function. And that is uh, reporting, uh, and, and we will come to that tomorrow, uh, the review process, that kind of thing. And therefore, it's of course good that working parties are uh, consist of TCPs with more or less the same topic. But if we try to add a kind of cross-cutting function to the, uh, to the working parties, and that has been tried, I think, a bit in the past, uh, then, then the trouble begins because several TCPs will then be in several working parties and it will get confused. And therefore, I like very much, as said, the coordination group uh, and especially the new one, uh, which is uh, limited in time, uh, focused on indeed the cross-cutting topic. And there, I think the, the, the bulk of the content or the focus of the content should be. And there, of course, please, no administrative stuff. Oops. Thank you very much for, for these remarks. I, I think related to the, uh, to the uh, TCP uh, networking days, countries, I, I think this is very country specific. Some countries are engaged in a lot of TCPs, other or only in a few. Some have more resources, some have less. So I also think it doesn't make sense to to specify whether this has to happen on an annual basis or or a different period. And I, I think it is important the comment that, that that you made that the role of the working party is also to translate, elevate, and condense the output of the TCPs. But it's uh, not an easy task. Yeah, maybe one last comment. Thank you. Um, I thought with the sort of introduction of the new TCP coordination groups, then couldn't they serve some of the role of the working parties? Because if you if you've got both those organisations, then it seems to me there's quite a lot of work and another bit of bureaucracy. Um, and my other query was about the national. TCP sort of networks and days because you know we're all international organizations so I wasn't quite sure what purpose they would serve I mean this is great all meeting together like this but um for us I, I'm not sure what the value would be especially as we're based in the UK and the UK government hasn't been a member of our TCP for years so I mean perhaps we're unique in that setup but I'm not sure what the value would be of this national layer. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm happy to share what I think the value is, both as a CERT member and uh, as a representative of a national government. Uh, we've done one so far in Canada. We intend to do more. Uh, we're members of, I think, maybe 24. TCPs, primarily government representatives, but not exclusively. And uh, I think it is uh, valuable as certainly as a CERT member, but in our other uh, undertakings with the IEA and other uh, colleagues internationally to understand sort of the full range um, of work that is happening internationally where there is collaboration. So essentially what it is, is the... Uh, the representatives, of, so in our case, obviously Canadian representatives of all of the TCPs that we're members uh, of come together. Uh, we did it virtually because it was during the pandemic, but I know other countries have done it in person as well. So you come together sort of for however long you think is needed, which is probably dictated by how many uh, TCPs you are a member of perhaps. Um, and you know, we, we developed a program that allowed for connections between uh, the TCPs, so uh, where there might be um, areas of work that are, are cross-cutting or related, but they maybe didn't know that each other was do were doing work in this space. So to connect on that level, also helpful um, 
uh, sort of as the coordinating uh, person or uh, office responsible for all of the TCPs to understand the range of work so that when I come to a certain meeting or I go to uh, other meetings internationally, I understand mm -hmm. sort of where we are active. And then I think that the other piece is just to, it helps orient around priorities. So, I mean, I'm not gonna tell TCPs what to do or not do, but it gives me a sense of, are we active internationally in the R&D space in the areas where we think we need to be in terms of like, are there gaps, for example? Um, are we hitting all of the priorities? Something has emerged. Is there, uh, is there already an existing avenue? We've already talked about uh, all of the um, all of the initiatives or the initiatives that tend to pop up from time to time uh, centered around sometimes ministerial meetings or otherwise. Um, it's useful to be able to know that these things exist uh, to say, hey, you know, this already exists. Let's make sure we're not duplicating or uh, what I like to do a lot of the time, here's my secret, is uh, sometimes we'll get pushed to put things in an international agreement. I often point back to multilateral mechanisms like MI, like the TCPs, uh, like SEM, where I know that there's a focused work plan in a particular area. It's just, it's really, really useful to be able to do that to avoid new things popping up. So hope that helps. That's just a Canadian perspective, yeah. Sorry, can I come back? I just misunderstood. I thought you meant all the TCPs that were based in a particular country getting together. So, yeah. Thank you. Well, I, I think it depends on the way how it is organized. But I mean, uh, we also organize in Switzerland, we also organize those national TCP days. And for instance, we also invited a, repre a representative from the IEA to, to inform us about a high level initiatives that are going on and so on. I, I, I think that's the, the exact purpose to, to coordinate and enhance the communication again. I think we have to move to the next slide. <clears throat> and uh, so there, there are some, I mean, we already discussed this now to a large degree. So these are proposed activities of certain the working party delegates. The, uh, I, was, I think the uh, identification of a national TCP network coordinator uh, I, I think for a lot of countries, this is already quite a big task. And then the national days, regularly assessing national participation in TCPs and alignment with national priorities, uh, sharing information and best practices in TCP participation and administration, facilitating communication between national representatives of international platforms in clean energy, including the TCPs, MI and SEM that just was mentioned. Then then of course, uh, other suggestions uh, from the group. I'll give you some time to reflect on this. Maybe a couple of very concrete suggestions to translate this into, into specific actions. This issue of sharing information and best practices on TCP participation uh, administration I think if back-to-back um, -back with, for instance, uh, REUP meetings, there was a half day um, uh, booked for TCPs to exchange information, uh, maybe with the IA facilitating a little bit like uh, uh, clusters of TCPs, you know, that have more synergies uh, would make, I think, uh, would increase the value of participating in those meetings for, for chairs and secretaries and whatever, whoever is representing the, um, the TCP. And then, maybe a simple suggestion, if there are TCP national days organized, if the SAM, NMI, Sherpas, focal points, points of contact could be involved, I think that would be ideal so that there is really a complete picture uh, since it's all IEAs facilitated, let's say, uh, activities, um, then you really have a complete picture uh, of, of what's going on and, and possible uh, synergies. Uh, just one, one reflection to add to what Amanda said about the, the value of these TCP national days. The other thing I found was useful in our case was that it it highlighted the value of the investment nationally in TCP activities because it showcased some of the, the outputs and, and impacts. Um, in terms of other suggestions, uh, I, I've mentioned already this question of whether it would be useful for how to have a cert uh, and or working party briefing reports, annual reports to, to TCPs. Um, and another one, it reflects on something I mentioned earlier, and it's probably here, but I'm not sure how to articulate it properly. But I, th I think there is a, a, a broader um, 
usefulness in in government officials uh, in particular to build or develop um, mechanisms for absorptive capacity for increasing their absorptive capacity for for what's coming from the the kind of analytical community or in this case from from TCPs. Um, that, that's a very broad thing to say. So, you know, in terms of breaking it down into to suggestions, well, maybe as, as, as a broad thing, I think it's something that might be useful for, for CERT to reflect on. Um, but in terms of some of the specifics, we, we, we heard earlier about the TCP secondment to the IEA, but equally you could have uh, government officials, I don't know if that would work, government officials mm -hmm. being opening up that opportunity for secondment in other directions. You know, where, where government officials working on a particular task or a particular um, um, area of, of, of policy to have a mechanism where they can directly engage and, and kind of uh, absorb that from a TCP. Uh, as a, I'm not sure of the structure for that, but secondment is, is possibly the wrong word, but some way of, of that bridging, I suppose, to, to explore better ways of bridging between TCPs and um, the, the working party delegates and and CERT. And, and it's really to try and increase this absorptive capacity of the policy system to be able to draw on the analysis that the TCPs are generating and, and make use of it. Thank you. Any other comments or do you see anything particular missing? Hmm? Um, wonder if um, there should be some feedback uh, on the stuff that's going to and fro uh, because there's still, I can't see um, anywhere where it actually says, okay, uh, we provide this, they provide that but there's uh, nothing that I can see which uh, there's an assessment by the recipient of whether that actually was what they wanted, whether it worked, um, and whether there's some subsequent refinement of that. Otherwise, we could chug on with the same thing until we meet again, say, in the next two, three, four years, and then discuss like this and make a change, but it could be a bit more responsive than that, maybe. More feedback. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really good suggestion. Um, I think these days it's, you know, everything takes time, nothing is easy, but it's relatively easy to uh, do a survey uh, periodically, just in terms of exactly these things. Is it working? Is it what we need? Do you need more of this, less of this? Any other suggestions? I think that's a fantastic idea. So thank you. I mean, there's one simple uh, formalized way. So of course, when you have to request for extension, then you typically get, get, get an extensive feedback, but I guess it would be helpful to have this also on a more regular basis. And in a, in a different way, not just that the whole program is uh, is examined, but you just get specific feedback on results. Um, actually, indeed, that I, I do think that these were key recommendations with regard to the um, uh, network coordinator and TCB national days, because uh, for communicating from TCPs to, to policy level is actually the interpersonal relations are, are key from that point of view. And, and as long as there is no contact between the third delegate or the working party delegate and the, and the TCP, then it's very difficult. <laughs> and uh, and uh, once this is con contact is there and the whole co community knows that who is who and who can expect what from from those persons, then it it, it becomes more, uh, more more feasible. And we actually just uh, last week we organized a TCP meeting with all the commission colleagues involved in in TCPs. And um, it created some anxiety at the beginning because, uh, I mean, some of the TCP representatives saw that what are these guys wanting from us <laughs> at this stage? They never talked to us and uh, why is this invitation now? Uh, but in the end, it was a good uh, dynamic there. And, and, and then, you know, through this, because, you know, within the same country or organization, that, that's 
that the trust is there, that you are on the same side, <laughs> let's say, the, the, the background knowledge is, is, is also there, that what is needed in, 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 in uh, in that organization or government. So you can you can tailor the information that's coming from the TCP for the needs of that specific uh, government. So these interpersonal relations, I think in that regard are, are key and uh, those frameworks can, can, can help with it. Can I ask you then one thing? So, you know, like in all these uh, committees with the TCPs, chairs are changing on a quite regular basis, delegates are changing on a quite regular basis. So how do you think uh, are there ways to improve this kind of uh, interpersonal uh, relations? And, and many times also, I think this is uh, probably work for the IEA and the secretariat to, to really have just an, an organigram so people know who is in charge of what uh, at a certain time and that you have points of contact. Yeah, I mean, that, 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 that's a fair question. Uh, uh, I mean, it depends. We do have colleagues uh, who are involved for a decade long in the same TCP. So uh, that also exists. And, and but on the other hand, I recognize that, especially in my unit, I, in, in, the, in the PVSP, um, uh, TCP, I know that uh, DG Energy colleagues have been changing all the time, <laughs> basically. And, and uh, yeah, these are framework conditions that you, that, that, that you can't do much about it, actually, because, because that's just the nature of, of public administration and people moving on. If there is not anything else, then let's uh, move on to. But excuse me, ju just to add, but exactly from that point of view, these structures can help because if you organize those meetings regularly, then you will be able to, you know, keep up with those personal changes. If you don't organize those, then you keep up losing the, the, those contacts. Okay, so now we come to the activities proposed uh, for the IA Secretariat. So prepare briefing material about the TCP network, uh, the role of CERT, its working parties and TCPs, update the delegates hub regularly with uh, information, improve the visibility of TCPs on the IEA website, communicate the success stories and results of the TCPs, drawing on past experiences, newsletters, uh, one-pagers, today in the lab, tomorrow in energy, organize webinars relevant to such as the management of the TCPs to learn from each other, Organize the TCP Universal meeting every two years at a minimum. Other suggestions from you. So that's quite a bit of activities, yes. Maybe as a general point, uh, better few and have continuity than a lot of these and uh, having them say uh, two newsletters and then think, well, this might not be a good idea and drop it and go to something else. Because I can remember that there were at some point in time newsletters, but they suddenly disappeared. And uh, picking up on, on the foregoing discussions, the, it is, I think, a characteristic of international organizations that the cycle and, and the time to gets these interpersonal relationships is much longer than in a national or uh, situation or in an organization. So the, the communication should be tuned to, to that longer cycle and, and, not, uh, and not say to a hit and run uh, stuff. So that's, yeah, that may be uh, not so easy, but uh, yeah, this should be certainly on a, say five year plan basis uh, and then choose what you want to do and then stick to that for a number of years so that people can get used to it and, uh, and, and value it. Maybe, maybe on the same point, uh, I think the IEA had a long time, the open energy period, huh? Uh, which has disappeared. I don't know exactly why, but I think that seemed to me like a one communication channel that was quite helpful to communicate also TCP results. We have usually advertised our conference. And um, I, I agree that having newsletters can be also an, a, a quite additional effort, but something like that for the whole, for the whole IA, 
shouldn't be too much, and I think it's it's really missing a bit. I don't know why it disappeared. Probably just the discourse question, but I would propose maybe to think about um, starting again with it. And there was a but there was a kind of newsletter, the, the so-called Open Energy Bieta, which was sent out, I don't know, maybe every month or so. And there were news from IEA results and TCP results and so on. So, so, so that will be your expectation that the IEA Secretariat provides a newsletter with IEA activities, plus also information about TC selected TCP outputs. Like in, I, th I think this is also key to have like uh, one newsletter. I mean, every TCP typically has a newsletter, but you do not want to, as a CERT member, probably do not want to subscribe to 50 newsletters. <laughs> and uh, yeah, um, uh, this is uh, really helpful. I think I'm, I'm trying to think of, I see a lot of, it would be helpful to understand even more, I think, like what the what would be helpful to you to have in the newsletter. So, because I've heard a few, like I, I have a few different ideas, but I also don't want to uh, read my interpretation into what you're saying. So I think there's obviously one objective, I assume, would be to share information and news about TCPs with other TCPs, but also with uh, CERT and the Secretariat. I would assume a, a second objective or category of useful info would be uh, sharing news from the IEA Secretariat and CERT, as has been said, out with TCPs. Um, and then maybe there's, I'm guessing, uh, there might be a third category of information, which might be like useful, other useful things that are happening that are handy for the community to know. Is that, I don't want to go too far off. And then my, the, the related point I had is I know there is a delegates hub um, that the IEA runs that all TCPs uh, have access to for their TCP documents. I know as CERT members, we have access to it for our uh, meeting documents and, and relevant information. I think we can uh, look at uh, some TCP info as well. I wonder if there's a way of better leveraging um, that delegates hub to make sure that there is the right access and the right information sort of pairings uh, to maybe reduce the need uh, of preparing sort of a formal newsletter. Not that it couldn't be there, but I think if your inbox is anything like mine, sometimes things get lost in there if emails are coming in with, with newsletters from different places and it might be handy um, just to know that, you know, once a month, this is gonna be updated with uh, this type of information and I can go there at any point in time and see what the most current is, just a thought. Maybe what is missing is social media. Uh, so a newsletter can be hard to sustain over time um, and, and experience shows that that was the case in the past. Uh, while for instance, of course, not for all TCP outputs, but for, for major reports uh, that are in line with IEA's priorities, if they could be picked up by the IEA in social media, of course, I would uh, make more justice to those reports. And uh, I have the feeling sometimes we've been in the IEA by energy TCP thinking about how uh, we uh, make justice to this incredible wealth of information that we produce and we don't have the means to do that effectively in this very complicated world where with a lot of voices and a lot of inputs that we get from everywhere and I think it's a problem that all TCPs face so but maybe all together and with the IEA help uh, if the website is improved um, and uh, if we have more of a systematic way of as I mentioned before maybe if we because I think we talked a lot about how to improve communication to the working parties and to CERT, but the world out there doesn't probably even know what the CERT and the working parties are. It's a very internal communication, which is key and fundamental. But if we wanna, I think, make justice to everything that we do here, we need to make sure that this technical information is communicated and, and is mainstream into the debate, then somebody has to pick it up and our own websites don't have the capacity to sustain that and to have that impact. So if IEA can pick up things and when a report on a certain topic is produced, if they can also make reference to other uh, relevant uh, TCP reports that have been produced recently, of course, anything that can be done in that direction would be a great help. 
Thank you very much. I think this is a very important comment, but of course it also, it is a political issue because like a report of a TCP is not necessarily the opinion of the IEA. And so they, you cannot just use the IEA channels to, to promote the, the TCP work, but 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 I get I get, I guess it's uh, it's also within the uh, scope of the work of the CERT and the working parties to to figure out how, how this can be improved. Uh, I think and I think what you said I think probably sometimes it's best to have both of two worlds to have a newsletter but have that information also on the delegates hub. Maybe just sometimes newsletters today are basically just a su um, summary of headlines and links. Mm -hmm. And then you can click and go to the news. And I don't think that really is a lot of work. I would suspect that nowadays you might be even able to do it with a little bit of artificial intelligence. Um, and uh, I think then it could be a good means of getting informed when there is something new on the delegates hub. Otherwise, I would have to go there. Uh, and simply this activity also sometimes get lost. So it could be an easy way to to maybe improve the communication. I think oh, sorry. I was too fast. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, 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 I don't do that. Um, I, I, there, is, there is an additional breakout uh, session about external communication. And I, I, I think this is, a, this is a big thing, And uh, but you need a coherent strategy. Uh, it's really a coherent strategy that is required. Do, do you see any additional... Uh, sort of activities that the IEA secret secretariat could engage in to support or facilitate the work? Yeah, thank you. It's actually not an additional one. I'm just looking in the slide. I would like to stress on the fourth point here about the success stories of TCPs and then in the one pagers, because I represent a, a ministry here and um, the thing is quite a new member in IA in like two years or so, and we're getting to know what what TCP is about, what they're doing in your work. And but there's so much information about so much TCPs, and especially for those ones which had decades long work. And sometimes it's really hard for, for, for me to transmit what TCP is about to my colleagues, but even harder to my minister, because he always has this policy impact question. So what's policy impact of uh, technology? What's the policy impact of, in this case, TCP? So, so sometimes it's hard. So my, I think that such a format, it, it could, could work. And maybe it's an expectation both from the secretariat and TCPs to think about. In addition, what you achieve and, and what results are just an, an update on, you know, on, on a one page or what, what's, what are you working with and what you have achieved. We have an example in another field. We have a cooperation with Nordic Energy Research, the Northern Council of Ministers uh, Agency for Funding Energy, and we collectively um, fund energy related R&D um, uh, studies. So in, in the first two years, they were producing excellent results, but so it, the communication part was really, really uh, <laughs> difficult. But then we started asking them that, in addition to the full report of of of, of, the, of findings, and one page is produced, and it, I think it worked. It, it's much much easier to to transmit this to our political management. So that's our results, and you know, what's why is it important? So then we have an answer. So maybe it could work here as well. Thank you. Maybe in line with that and to connect with the, the foregoing point uh, where there was, uh, we talked about reporting and the different levels. Uh, if you have a good basis of reporting, then that can be a source, a good source for a newsletter. And then, as somebody said, then, uh, of course, you need to put resources into it. And I very much doubt whether I would trust AI to do that. But maybe with the help <laughs> uh, uh, but but then at least you have a, a kind of a strong and regular basis uh, where you can uh, also uh, which you can say disseminate in in different formats and and uh, the delegate hub is then one uh, but there it's more like an archive and passive the newsletter is more active and and maybe there are other uh, and if you have the good basis, then uh, it's more easy to uh, to disseminate that in different formats. 
thank you. Uh, just one comment. So organizing uh, webinars uh, uh, would be very useful, but not only for the uh, management of the TCP and the current TCP uh, participants, but uh, also for uh, potential participants. In Hungary, we are uh, not active in TCPs. I know only one participant, but uh, these uh, webinars uh, would be very useful for them uh, to uh, uh, to gain information from the first hand and to know uh, uh, good practice. So I think it will be very, very useful. Thank you. I mean, you're referring to, to webinars to reach out to potential new member countries and inform them about TCP work? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just a very minor comment regarding the TCP universal meeting every two years is fine, but I wouldn't say this as a minimum. I would not propose to have it more frequently. Thanks. I think everybody agrees. <laughs> um, I, I guess we move on to, to the next slide so that we still have a little bit of time for, for those things. So now we're coming to the work of the TCPs. I um, mean, of course, provide an annual written briefing, provide status updates on the request of CERT or a working party, provide inputs to the IA Secretariat's activities, such as newsletters and one-pagers. Um, I mean, this is also related to what we just discussed before. Such uh, communication channels do not work if they're not feed uh, with input. Then uh, invite and involving CERT or work party working party delegates, as well as IA desk officers in EXCO meetings. Uh, establish communication with initiatives under the other international platforms like SEM or the ministerials and uh, other suggestions, again. Um, one suggestion would be to include um, automatically include the TCPs in the peer review of reports related to that technology. Uh, I think as of now, it's done on an individual basis. It's up to the analyst or to the author of the report to liaise with the relevant TCPs. But I'm aware of cases in which that was that person was not even aware necessarily of the existence of the TCP or the or the or the the work that the TCP was carrying out. So I think having that as a um, systematic thing would allow the TCPs not necessarily to get the recognition of the work, but to have the work mainstreamed into the main uh, IA reports. I'm just reflecting on the fourth bullet point there that um, it might then involving CERT and, and working party delegates as well as the desk. So the desk officers are already invited to, to EXCO meetings. I, I suspect the, the CERT and we working party delegates, if they attended a full EXCO meeting, they, <laughs> it's a big ask. Um, so I, I, I wasn't sure what was, uh, and maybe it's, it's either refining or reflecting on it because it, it would be useful maybe to invite a CERT or working party delegates to, to a, a specific part of the EXCO meeting if there's something of use that can um, be exchanged, I suppose, because uh, we have the mechanisms where where um, exco uh, the the um, TCPs report uh, and attend uh, and report to um, working party and and cert meetings. So it is useful, I think, to have that flow in the other direction. But I, I think it'd be worth thinking about what the how to 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 do it in a way that's actually useful for both. Um, and not painful for both. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I, I think this is a good comment. Uh, I think no cert member or working or active in working party can uh, take part in a lot of excos at the same time. But for instance, uh, I took part in uh, in the HEV exco activity, which was uh, particularly focused on just the uh, the next uh, strategic work plan. So where you really discuss the strategy of uh, and what's going to happen next, I think such kind of meetings there might make sense, but of course not when you go through all the exco tasks and through the administration. Just to pick up on that, uh, I agree with you, Brian, and I, I, 
I'm guessing that that was not the intent, but I think it's just in crafting agendas, for example, think through are there areas where either the IEA uh, desk officer or CERT or working party delegates, where either it would be um, useful for you, uh, for one of those people to attend and hear something, or if it would be useful for you to have a report out on anything that had happened, whether at CERT or in the IEA secretariat or what have you. I think it's more just keep that in mind. Yeah, I think also here there's a differentiation between, uh, I think it's always useful and in 4E we have that as a kind of a default agenda item to get a report from the desk officer. And, and we also always like uh, the desk officer to be uh, to be present, uh, whereas indeed certain and uh, working party delegates, uh, yeah, that would be, uh, I guess, death by uh, uh, by attending exco meetings. Uh, so that that indeed would need to be reserved for uh, more the strategic uh, issues. So that that would be good to uh, to differentiate. Uh, further, the first three bullets uh, again. I think these are all of all of these. I think is uh, or or could be fine if it's clear structured and there is a clear uh, say uh, expectation management uh, towards the TCP uh, what can be expected at what time so the annual written briefing uh, I, I think that uh, that is very clear on the positive side uh, every TCP knows uh, it's also known when it comes but uh, when I read uh, possible status updates or request of the CERT or a working party, when do they come? And what is the response time that you uh, that you then expect? And there it's, it could become uh, cumbersome uh, and, and such uh, the same as input to uh, the secretariat's activities. And that's why uh, in the foregoing slide, I... I pleaded for having a stable good basis where others could find the information uh, which is both I think efficient for uh, for TCPs and for the secretariat and of course if there's good relationship which I hope there is between the desk officer and the TCP then of course the desk officer can always send an email or phone or we need information on blah 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 and and that's yeah but Please, uh, with the first three bullets, uh, try to make that uh, yeah, as structured and, and predictable as uh, possible. And also the, uh, say the last one above other suggestions, uh, this is, could be a very broad and, and, uh, and resource intensive task. And that is also where TCPs are, uh, a bit shy of and backing uh, if if they are if they are expected from their budget uh, to do all of these uh, communications uh, because that can be very uh, resource intensive. Plus, I guess many times for for this particular task, it would be helpful to have support to establish the the connection to to the initiatives. I I think with the uh, provision of. Uh, of reports and uh, briefings, like the first three bullets, I think the, the bullet, uh, bullets number one and two are, of course, uh, that's sort of mandatory, what you have to do. But I think the bullet number three is also the chance to to use the IEA channel to, to communicate. But, but I guess uh, it could be facilitated in the way that the uh, secretariat informs that newsletters are planned, other kind of information material, if you would like to contribute uh, information for that. So that could be facilitated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I think what I heard is uh, every, you're busy. <laughs> I know the IEA Secretariat uh, is also busy. Uh, and so it's a plea to make 
the format uh, of the request for information as clear and as succinct as possible. Um, and I just wanted to uh, reiterate, I can't remember who was making the point this morning, but I know we talked a little bit uh, about, you know, the, the point of some of this is uh, to help us <laughs> and help the IEA Secretariat help TCPs in terms of uh, communicating messages out and up, uh, including to ministers. And so I think it's it's a chance uh, to put in your own words, especially that third bullet, you know, what, what are the really um, sort of the concrete headline message that you would want to get across? Because I think you, you don't want to leave that in somebody else's hands. Like if I'm if I'm the TCP, I, I want to make sure that I'm in there crafting that message. If I'm writing something about my office, I want to be the last word or the last person who who looks at it and make sure that it uh, is it's completely capturing what I intend. And so I just wanted to say I I I completely support the idea between uh, or of being as as clear and as helpful as possible in the way that we're asking for the information. But I just wanted to 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 maybe underline um, that the objective here is is to help spread <laughs> the message of the TCPs and and to help TCPs. So um, I, I think that as we heard this morning, I think ultimately the more clear the message can be, uh, you know, the the more it resonates with people like ministers. Uh, the better the chance that that at some point translates into into you know things like additional funding. A short comment on that. Exactly what you said that you want to be the last person that uh, sees the message that you sent. That can be an issue because in an exco, if if that is really uh, and I don't know how formal other uh, TCPs are, but if that is practiced, then it will take a long time before any message is formally issued. So that that can can be a problem. And in practice, uh, we had such a thing with the the joint TCP work, uh, which we which there were uh, say a number of uh, work of the TCP combined in one IA report and I can remember that there, there was I think it took a couple of weeks and with a lot of fine tuning because before every TCP had officially agreed to to uh, say a half page summary and so there uh, and there maybe uh, it could be good to split uh things that uh, tcps may input something to the to the secretariat but it's the secretariat's responsibility uh to formulate to reformulate maybe and, and send it out and also clear that that is then uh, the ia's responsibility and and not uh, and not the tcps and that i think that will speed up things because otherwise uh yeah that you might uh, need to wait half a year before you get anything out uh, to, to. Okay. <laughs> but try to be quick we have to wrap up I, and i just wanted to to clarify like i i work in a bureaucracy i understand that um i i was talking about the third bullet which i understand to be providing input so you're providing like a paragraph or a blurb or a page or something on your stuff over so that's what i was talking about that input Thanks. So um, I think we just quickly go to the last slide, and that 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 would address mostly now uh, third delegates, country representatives. So what what you would consider the the highest value in uh, reports on TCP activities, like in the annual briefings? Well, what is it? What do you find really important, or what is missing? Uh, I just I think from a uh, the certain the working party delegates um, the important information is more about the maybe the research outcomes and the next steps um, as much as the kind of list of of reports or the in depth kind of analysis which is great mm -hmm. for the technical community to read but um, yeah we need you to spoon feed us sometimes. Um, and uh, also it'd be great to know uh, about who contributed to the, the project. I think part of uh, some of the CERT delegates that we've spoken to were all 
on the same journey with TCPs and trying to work out who from our own countries uh, that you're working with, engaging with. Um, and so it's actually really useful to say, here's a report, um, and then also to know kind of some of the specific uh, inputs to that so we get a better understanding of the landscape. But the first part's the more important one in terms of um, what's what's the outcomes and, and next steps from this, this research. You've, yeah, we now understand this, so what? So you would like to have a policy brief and the highlights. Or a hybrid uh, or something that maybe says, these are the things that maybe as policy people you should you should consider or the, the implication of, of this from a technical perspective is, you know, where this could go from here. Sure, I also found the second point interesting, like because like the TCP network is so large, there's so many tasks, so many operators, so many participants that I think for a lot of countries, they, they simply don't have to overview they don't even know what kind of institutions in their country are active in, in, in the TCPs and in what way. And yeah, I mean, this is, uh, of course, also additional work for the TCPs to somehow summarize that in an annual report. Any other comments here? And then I think we can all go and then coffee. Yeah. Yes, I have one comment. Um, maybe also like what assumptions are underlying the report, I think would also be quite valuable. Like what is the report based on? Like, what is the, um, uh, yeah, like basically the assumptions, if that's clear. <laughs> I mean, uh, I think that's that, that's quite specific. I mean, when you make scenario modeling, uh, th then of course you, you have a lot of assumptions. Yeah, uh, yeah. Wh when you report uh, technical experiments, it's 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 probably less. But uh, but I mean, like the, I think that's a problem. The nature of an annual report, it's not a scientific paper. So it's it's already condensed, but it's not the brief. So you have to to find the right format. Mm -hmm. Last comment. Uh, so briefly, I think on, on the one hand there is value in knowing the international cooperation that's going on. So I think someone has already alluded to that that just recording at at uh, government level that what are those multilateral engagements that anyone is involved in and that it's working and it's meaningful i think that's one valuable information then the second is is directing i mean uh, the the information and and reports coming from the tcps are not always relevant for the third delegate but the third delegate must find the people his colleagues in the relevant units and and, and divisions uh, for whom it is relevant. And, and for those uh, colleagues, it can be even detailed information because that's their job and they want to have detailed, uh, well-founded information. The, you know, the schlag words, the, 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 the headlines are not enough for policy making. For those who are uh, drawing up uh, legislation, regulation, whatever, they want to have the substantive part of the information. And then maybe the last point, it relates to the previous uh, slides, uh, just one good example about uh, from the ISGAN uh, TCP about uh, um, links to other international platforms. But in ISGAN, we have kind of a table with liais liaison officers uh, for the uh, various other uh, international platforms. And uh, th usually those are colleagues who are involved in those other activities too. So we can use those channels kind of actively to, to align uh, messages and activities. I think that's a, that's a good practice. Thank you very much. I, I think that's quite a few good suggestions. Um, I mean, there's always uh, room for improvement. And I think it also reflects uh, what, what you said at the very beginning, that reports and briefings, you should always address specific target groups. So have it both, have, have like a short highlights policy brief, and then also have in-depth information if the expert then really wants to go into the detail. Okay, so if somebody still has a very important comments they would like to make, then I leave the floor open. And otherwise I think we can uh, start with the coffee break, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, everyone, I think we'll get underway. All right, welcome back. Hope you had a chance to uh, grab a coffee, maybe a cookie, have some good conversation during the break. Uh, I, hope, I hope that the uh, first session of the afternoon uh, was useful. Um, as you know, that one focused on the internal side of communications within the TCP uh, CERT network. Uh, but we're gonna focus uh, for the balance of the afternoon on external uh, communications. Um, I'm gonna hand it over to Paul, uh, our French CERT delegate, and also the uh, representative from Peltovit photovoltaic power system since the end of the day uh, to run us through uh, the next session. Paul. Oh. Thank you, Amanda. So now that everyone got uh, warmed up with uh, workshops on internal communication, we're, we're now looking at external communication. Um, so I prepared some introductory remarks. You, you're no less than, than 39 TCPs and you're all a bit different working on uh, providing technologies and policy recommendations that are so important in, in the fight against uh, climate change. So each of your, your TCPs decide within your EXCOs uh, with some guidance uh, by the oversight structure uh, on what should be worked on as a priority. This afternoon is about better delivering, better communicating on the results of your work. It's on improving the impact of communication, making sure that what you all have been working on so hard lands well with the intended uh, audiences. Um, so uh, I was very happy to learn uh, during the coffee breaks that uh, because we send a big package of, uh, of slides as, as homework, so to speak, and some of you have actually read uh, through 106 pages. Uh, so this afternoon there will be a, a lighter version that will be, will be presented. So your 39 TCPs, and you're all a bit different, like I said, some of you have really pinpointed your offering, uh, for instance, uh, to the scientific community. And, but most of you, I think, have broader target groups, uh, which required, require sending different messages to different groups of people. So I, I represent the, uh, the French Agency for Ecological Transition at them. And we're involved in, in many TCPs, uh, but with the ministry, we were having a hard time getting a good overview of its outcomes. And I guess that we're not the only one. So the technical reports that are being produced are often a bit difficult to access. Um, they're quite scientific for one. Um, and the websites of, of some of the TCPs are sometimes a bit outdated. And that's just to name some of the hurdles, I think, that, that people that are interested by your work may, may come across. So this, this is not helping um, in getting the TCPs and their results known, also not known to, to French stakeholders. And it also makes it hard, from, from my perspective uh, as an agency representative, to, to seduce French experts to participate in the works of your, your TCPs. So is, is it fair to compare a typical TCP with a factory, a factory that's producing knowledge, uh, but only has a small sales department? So lots of production, but few resources spent on, on, on selling what you have been producing. Of course, we're, we're talking seriously technology. We're not talking about a cookie factory, but could your knowledge product be better promoted? Could it be packaged in such a way that the results can be improved? And maybe should the basic product itself also sli be sliced a little bit differently? And finally, do you know your stakeholders sufficiently well and do they know your TCP? So maybe a small anecdote, uh, two years ago, so I'm representing PVPS, uh, we were having a, um, a technical visit at, at one of the prestigious uh, French uh, PV institutes. And so we met with its director and it was all very well and we got this, this nice tour. And in the end, I wanted to have some advice on, on how PVPS uh, could improve it, its functioning and its offerings. And we're, it was a bit of a cold shower because the director didn't know that much about PVPS. So it was kind of a sobering uh, fact that uh, although we think that we are doing great work, it wasn't recognized by, by at least the players that we thought were important to us. 
Um, so I'm Exco Alternate and Vice Chair Communications uh, at PVPS, and I'm also involved in reviewing tasks, reports before publications. So I've learned firsthand of some of the difficulties that TCPs uh, like PVPS are facing. So it's ranging for, from help that experts need to identify key messages uh, from their work to the absence of, for instance, indicators, the number of downloads or of technical reports, uh, to discovering that when you want to update a communication st strategy, that there wasn't one in the first place. So uh, I know a little bit of the, the, the internal workings and the problems that you as a TCP can face when, when you start to work uh, a little bit more seriously on communication. So as a national agency, we would like very much to see that the outcomes of all the TCPs uh, is easily digestible, accessible, relevant for policy advisors, um, but very much also for the branches that are concerned by the TCP topics. And we figured that the TCPs as a group uh, are doing very well, and they have many great practices to, to share that each TCP, individual TCP can benefit and learn from. And we think we, we would like to share these needs, that we share these needs with, with many of you. So 39 TCPs, that, that's quite a big number. Uh, and that's why in very close collaboration with the IA Secretariat, so I would like to name a uh, Anna Kalista and, and Casey Michaels, who have been very involved over the past uh, 12 months. Um, so the Secretariat and uh, the BCW uh, consulting group, we analyzed only a limited number uh, of, of TCPs, seven actually. Uh, so that came down to holding, to holding interviews with them and also to analyze their, their websites, their production and to come up with uh, recommendations. <laughs> So it was a rational approach because it's only limited to seven, we need to be efficient, but also a very positive approach as we were seeking for very positive messages that could, can be shared with all of you. So today we want to share and discuss these recommendations with you. We hope that you will get excited uh, by the remaining untapped communication potential for your TCP and that you will drive home the results of this afternoon's exchange for further discussion within your Excos, and that you will get organized to kickstart working on improvements if you deem that useful. So we acknowledge that this will take time. It will take its time to acquire necessary competencies. And for that, you may probably also need additional budget or reallocate budgets. But we would love to meet in the near future so that each of you can present and share the progress and possibly also some tangible results that you will have uh, produced with all of us. So I, I'm quite sure that this afternoon will be quite interactive and inspiring, and I promise you won't get, uh, you won't get bored. So let's see, there's a, a slide. So a little bit what I discussed, so the assignment was initiated by, by ADEM and, and the Secretariat, and it was really driven by, by a need that we felt at ADEM in, in France. Uh, but I think it's shared with, with many of you. And so uh, we, would, would, we think it can be helpful to improve the impact of, of uh, all your communications for your productions and publications. And so the... Uh, it will be what will now will be presented is the recommendations based on the best practices. And we'll sum it all up to in about an hour from now with recommendations on how to take things a step further. Um, so it's a partnership with BCW. So it's uh, Caroline Cloué and Anne McCluskey who are in the center of the room. And I'm now happily presenting uh, the word to you. Thank you. Oops. So good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Paul. Um, uh, delighted to be here with you today. Um, Anne McCluskey from BCW. Um, just perhaps a few words about uh, who we are, our, our agency. So BCW Global is a 
essentially uh, a network of agencies um, from around the world who are present in 130 countries. We're part of the WPP group, which is one of the world's, let's say, most far-reaching communications services group. Um, what's our focus? We have an approach that aims to seamlessly, seamlessly weave a comprehensive narrative that engages the complete range of the most relevant stakeholders for the organizations um, that we work with. And we leverage every tool, every channel, and every tactic available to achieve the goals set by and often with our clients. Um, so in terms of our expertise, um, we cover the full spectrum of communications with the exception of advertising. Um, so that covers insights and analysis, corporate reputation, media relations, government relations and public affairs, influencer advocacy, issues and crisis, purpose and ECG, ESG, ESG sorry, <laughs> and financial communications. So that's it in, in a nutshell on who we are. So how did we work? Um, Paul uh, touched on this briefly. Um, we worked with a, a tried and true methodology through um, seven interviews uh, with a representative panel of the TCP. So we have 4E, HEB, users, bioenergy, PVPS, HPT, and combustion. And it was, um, we have to say, um, a most stimulating exercise for us because uh, we collected lots of very rich uh, input. So the, object the objective here was to understand TCP's communications, how, how you communicate, your needs, your constraints, activities, experiences, and of course, uh, your criteria performance. Then, as Paul already mentioned, we did um, uh, a website analysis. And this was really to ensure that the website, as you all know, um, plays the full role of a showcase for your, your TCP activities. Um, but also as a tool of promotion, and we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit more detail in a while, um, as a lever of attractiveness to really accelerate the sharing of the knowledge that you produce, the very rich uh, um, and in-depth knowledge that you produce. And then um, in a third step, we, um, we analyzed uh, different publications with a focus on uh, the reports and two pages for, um, for policymakers. Um, our recommendations are driven really by a review of broader PCPs publications. So um, a lot of um, TCPs came up with newsletters, case studies, magazines and articles, mm. but we'll go through that in a little bit more detail in a while. Good afternoon. We had four levels of reading. First, uh, what we learned from interviews and analysis. This is the first level and we had a lot of quotes uh, in our report. Second, the best practices to uh, our point of view, that is to say the good practices to be generalized. Then we uh, have we had to share key recommendations to make progress by enhancing the value of work produced by you, the TCPs. And at the end, to go a step further, uh, we also uh, mentioned some, some guidelines on how to accelerate performance in communication. So how are we going to work this session this afternoon? Um, we're going to review together the key recommendations, as we already mentioned, that came out of the analysis. We've also prepared four rounds of questions, which will enable you all to react because one of the objectives this afternoon is to um, have an interactive session. Um, however, it's going to be very short. You will have <laughs> um, just a few minutes, so between five and 10 generally, um, to react to these different rounds of questions. Let's go through our recommendation. Um, beginning with, um, this way of extending audiences and with a picture and a question. Are you sure you have all reached all your audiences today? So that's the third question, which is uh, important uh, to us. And we recommend to make a mapping of your ecosystem. 
in order to be sure that you uh, have identified all the potential audiences that may be interested or related to the technologies and the research you, uh, you deal with. Uh, first point, step out of your comfort zone, so to say, to reach strategic ecosystems, to reach new networks and new communities. And second point, question your target ecosystem as a, uh, on a regular basis to entertain, to enrich your uh, audiences. As you can see uh, on the picture, in blue, you have your um, traditional uh, targets, as we heard from uh, interviews, so to say policymakers, industry um, actors, uh, other research makers and content makers also, that is to say journalists, uh, NGOs, uh, newspapers, etc. And this is our third point. We recommend to add additional target groups here in orange in the picture, such as financial bodies that also support research through, for example, investment funds, through industrial analysts who have, uh, as you know, sometimes a role of prescription uh, for technologies, but also uh, academic world at large with major universities, laboratories, or new emerging or new players, such as uh, startups and uh, young uh, enterprises. And also think and do tanks or specialized consultancies to develop this potential target audience. Fourth point, mobilize these stakeholders you already work with or you have identified through this process to enrich your database. And last recommendation, get yourself listed if possible in the circles that interest you and that you don't know or you don't um, participate yet. So we're now going to move on to the interactivity. Um, based on what Caroline just said, and uh, okay, you're going to have several pieces of information on the slide here. So um, on one hand, you need to, to be able to be interactive and to be able to um, give your input, you need to connect to what you see on the screen here. Um, so you have the, the site mentee.com and then you have to enter the, the code that's, uh, that's on the screen. And in the meantime, uh, this is, as our first round of questions, I'm gonna call out the questions that you can think about. And out of the four recommendations, um, we want to know which one do you consider to be the easiest to implement when it comes to extending audiences. So question one, question your target ecosystem regularly. So evaluate it and, um, and, and, and really decide what is interesting to, um, uh, to think about, um, get together and, uh, and have several points of view. Second question, add additional target groups to your initial mapping. Third question, mobilize the stakeholders you already work with to enrich your database. And fourth question, Caroline already mentioned it in, in her previous slide, get yourself listed in the circles that interest you and that you don't yet know. So you now have 10 minutes to react. I hope everything's clear.
has everybody expressed their votes? Yeah. Okay, so, so it looks as if we have uh, a winner, <laughs> which, is, uh, which is question three. So mobilize your stakeholders uh, you already work with to enrich your database, um, followed by question your target system regularly. And then we have um, two PARs with uh, add additional target groups to your initial mapping and get yourself listed in circles that interest you that you don't already know. Thank you. So we're now gonna move on to optimizing websites. Yes, I think we have somebody who has a question. Yes, I have a question. Uh, when it comes to database, can you extend a little bit what you understand on database? And when you reflect it with the requirements of uh, data projection and all this regulation that you have to fulfill, because that's one of the big challenges. Uh, yes, we don't have in mind something formal like uh, Excel, uh, an Excel file, for example, no, no, because it's uh, forbidden and it's not um, necessarily the best way to work with. So uh, our approach is uh, quite informal, but which, what is important is to have identified interesting uh, networks, interesting functions, organization and people, and to get in touch with them uh, as, as, as quickly as possible. Does that answer your question? Okay, let, let's move on then, since we're rather limited in time. Um, so I'm just gonna move on to optimizing websites. Um, so um, really to, to, to brand the homepage and to deliver and express the, the TCP promise, um, you, we have this, this slide that um, indicates on, on, on the right-hand side, the IEA uh, brand guide with, uh, with the seven different chapters. Um, introduction, visual guidelines, digital media, print media, communication guidelines, contact us. So to increase TCP's legitimacy as trusted science producers in a very competitive ecosystem of research players, our recommendation is and the IAEA, IEAs is to really use and follow closely the, the brand guide. And this is also to draw benefit from the IEA's reputation. Um, and then what we thought was interesting as well um, as, a, as, a, as a promise is to um, express yourself sharply um, in the about section um, on your website. So you can on one hand refer and have a descriptive, a descriptive standard introduction, if you like, to the TCP slash IEA, or you might prefer to have a more attractive promise, um, let's say a, a, a catchier kind of promise. Um, and we had two examples on the right-hand side that we thought were interesting. One is expressed as being, as having independent knowledge, and the other is international framework for cooperation and networking. So this is really accentuating your value proposition through carefully chosen and sharp words that resonate. As far as wording is concerned, promises and signatures can also be expressed in a sort of compact formulations and also in an editorial style. We have here two examples of uh, what we mean. Bioenergy with this promise accelerating to net zero, which goes straight to the point. If you want more information, read more, etc., etc. And the second example is related to users TCP. And uh, we can see here that by social technical research to inform policy making for clean, efficient, and secure energy transition, we have uh, this compact formula that gives sense plus energy 
to the presentation of the work and of the activity. We also recommend, strongly recommend using what we call visual um, vocabulary. So on the left hand side of the slide, um, you see um, a very attractive visual, um, which, which brings warmth um, uh, to, to the reader, to the, the person who's, uh, who's navigating your website versus what you have on the, on the right hand side, um, where, whereby you have a uh, more technical uh, graphs and visuals, which for us are really more appropriate for appropriate for integrating into the actual content um, of the work. Now, let's talk about in instructive language, and let's consider together that even your grandmother must be able to understand the research you do and the things you do. Okay. However complex the technologies, however complex the scientific contents, please keep it simple. There is some um, tools for that. You can use pictograms, such as here in the slide, uh, use pictos. We have uh, picked up some uh, models here. You can also use, of course, videos. You can use um, tutorials. And so on, so on, and so on. The 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 idea is to to be understood as large as possible and as with a, a degree of proximity to your audiences. Uh, so uh, from this very moment, all your grandmothers be part are part of your target audiences. <laughs> um, so another way um, of animating your, your homepage is to have uh, um, a lively and updated, a regularly updated news section. This um, shows that um, you are uh, in tune with, uh, with what's going on. It, it, it serves to provide uh, information on, um, on different trends and, um, and we think it's interesting to, to show a more open TCP. Um, also, if you have any events going on, the idea is to promote um, conclusions and um, include, when possible, um, uh, replays and links to um, on your webinars. Um, so we have uh, one example on the on the left hand side of the slide: um, a workshop entitled "Technology Advances in Liquid Biofuels and Renewable Gas." And so read more, uh, so you have the link. So you have the essential in the title. And, um, and again, it's, uh, it's good to, to promote this and to share as much as possible. And then, um, and then the invitation to actually join the debate um, and provide any facts that can actually um, bring the debate forward, let's say, but also, um, uh, let's say, safeguard and, and defend the technologies that you are promoting. And here we have so campaigns questioning the use of woody biomass for energy are missing key facts. And then the FAQs and the reports uh, and so on. Recommendation number five stimulate collaborative contribution. Here you can see as exa some examples of membership, how to join ideas and proposals, all this material uh, giving a positive signal to your audiences uh, that you are sending to your networks and, uh, and your, your communities. Um, if you have a suggestion for an international collaborative project, da, 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 please contact. Suggestions are, uh, are very welcome, etc. So uh, show you as a TCP uh, as, as open as possible to welcome ideas and contribution so uh, that we uh, describe yourself as an open entity and um, a lively entity. So we would strongly encourage you to share any success stories that you have um, because it just makes um, what you have to say a lot more concrete 
and and this is what speaks most to um, those visiting uh, your website. Um, so we found um, two interesting uh, examples here. So um, uh, bioenergy, bioenergy success stories. So divided into, um, first of all, you have the, the date, um, took place between 2013 and 2016, location in Germany, um, the technology they use, the principal feedstocks, uh, and so on and so forth. So the idea is really to have a short format, short and consistent and sharp, um, uh, highlighting really the success factors, the players involved, the impact um, when you can with facts and figures, and of course, highlight the sources of additional information to go even further. Last recommendation regarding websites is to anticipate information needs uh, through, for example, like here, uh, FAQs to anticipate answers to commonly questions about issues, different aspects of the research, uh, technologies involved in your works, etc. Um, it helps present a TCP that is in tune with the issues of society, which is of concern to a wider audiences. So you have the choice. Here we have chosen a few examples, uh, such as is energy from woody biomass positive for the climate, and so on and so on. So we're now going to go to the second round of questions. Um, well, in fact, no, the recommendations rather to be more precise. So if you can do as you did um, a while ago, um, and then what I'm asking you to do is out of the seven recommendations that we're listing here, um, which ones do you consider to be the most difficult to implement? So branding the homepage and the TCP promise, building a visual vocabulary, using instructive language, animating the homepage, stimulating collaborative contributions, sharing su success stories, and anticipating information needs. So I'll leave you to, to connect and, and vote, please. Okay, has everybody voted? Finish voting. Um, perhaps what might be interesting to share here, because we see that there are two that um, take up the biggest portion here. So one is uh, stimulating collaborative contributions and the other is building a visual vocabulary as being the most difficult recommendations to implement. Would anybody feel like expressing why? Why you find them difficult to implement? Any any takers? Um, well, stimulating contributions are, are fantastic, but uh, e extracting them from 
the participants of annexes and tasks uh, has proven very difficult over the years. Um, and it seems that pretty much any incentive that you offer doesn't always result in a flood of responses. Thank you. What about stimulating collaborative? Oh, sorry, what about building? Oh, sorry, sorry. So in our case, or in the case of our TCP, we find building the visual vocabulary, the, the big challenge. And it's often difficult to distill complex concepts down to a simple, understandable graphic that my grandmother would understand. Um, we don't have that skill amongst our technical experts um, and we struggle to isolate or find the resources to fund the right expertise to do that, that has the communication skill set and at least a fundamental understanding of our technical content to be able to work with our experts to do that. So that's um, kind of where we come at that challenge. Okay, thank you. We, we, we do appreciate um, the difficulty, but we did see some input that we found quite interesting. Thank you. Excuse me, is it possible to make uh, some comments on your questions? Um, I, I appreciate the question. I find that some are, if I may say, a little bit easy. For instance, the, when you say that you want, you recommend to use the IA brand, which I fully share. The fact is that if you want to issue a report with an IA brand, I mean, you have to go through the IA and the process is very cumbersome as far as I know. So even if you wanted, I mean, that is effectively a... I wouldn't say a non-start, but a very heavy process. Um, when you say that you want quick ways to, to join the community, I mean, again, this is the process tends to go through government, uh, through, you know, you know, ministerial approach to the IA. I don't know whether it's really a necessity to have a quick way to access, but I mean, it is not. And I think the nature of the TCP is such that, uh, yes, it's easy to say, but... Uh, Okay, you're welcome to talk to your neighbor on the right hand side and see whether you can improve that. Um, the website, again, is something very easy. I mean, we had the discussion in some TCPs. I mean, the website, you need somebody to host the website, to, to design the website, to maintain the website. And it's not obvious that the community that are involved in the TCP have the resources to do that on a, on a continuous basis. Because, I mean, worse than not having a website is to have a bad website. So. We need to, to foresee that. And, uh, and finally, you know, anticipating the questions, I would say that I agree with you, although the question tends to be very political. I work on nuclear fusion. I mean, I'm quite happy to answer to the question, is nuclear fusion good? But I don't think that the technical answer is satisfy anybody that you look at the question. So yes, you're right. Um, but the, the, the question may be very much of a political connotation. And I do not think it is for the TCP technical people to try to answer those. Okay, thank you. So let's go through um, a new slot of recommendation dedicated this time to publications. First recommendation, please facilitate the understanding of your own world. world. I mean, for example, this uh, particular way to simplify the understanding of your own organization. Here is an example of a diagram which ena enables us to understand how the research is, for example, subdivided, particularly by showing the tasks, appendices, projects, including several TCPs, links between other TCPs, timeline of the project, etc. It's important because it's easier uh, to understand how you work and therefore what you produce in terms of uh, research. The second example, 
year is to give an overview of milestones in your area of activity, such as key dates, such as technology, which are concerned by your research, and so on and so on, by this kind of images too. So, how to gain conviction. So on the next slide we have, yes, this is, so we continue on uh, optimizing publications. Um, what we think is, is a really good way um, uh, to do this is to really opt for the use of infographics when you can, uh, to really highlight uh, the essential, um, and we have this example uh, just below, um, key findings, ESL uh, report, which, which we think is really well done. So you have really the, the essence of what you want to say. It, it helps you distill. So you have the pictograms, you have the, the key facts and figures, you have the percentages. So you, it, it really helps to grasp the essential of, of what you want to communicate in a, in a light and easy to consult way. Um, on the right hand side of the slide, what we do um, recommend is to avoid what we call the catalogue effect of the year's achievements. But we think what we have um, in, in these examples um, is, is, is really good in the sense that you have um, a, a short summary of what you want to say, and then um, you have the links to if you know if somebody's interested. But it's it is important to to get the wording right so that um, uh, your your visitor, let's say, um, will want to go a step further and click on the links. Uh, the other recommendation we have is to work like journalists do. How do journalists work? They love playing with words. They love um, part of, I guess, their training is to really look for the essence of what they want to say and really encapsulate it into um, just a few words. And they come up with catchy phrases, catchy titles, um, really to, um, to attract and to stimulate and to, um, uh, I guess, uh, facilitate the reading as well. So, um, uh, this again, uh, just as, as a few examples, we've taken uh, for um, the heat pump systems. So good examples exist, more standardization needed. So the use of heat pumps in apartment buildings is possible on ready, so and so and so. Uh, then key findings, it is possible to use heat pump system in apartment buildings, is possible and already practiced and so on and more standardization needed, et cetera, et cetera. So really the idea as well is to insert subheadings, introductions, quotes whenever you can. Again, it's to, to give some air, um, to give some life and bring uh, what you want to say to life with um, the catchy wording as journalists do. <laughs> Our last uh, recommendation, convey emotion. Yes, you can through your publications. <laughs> yeah. What we would like to share with you today uh, is uh, this uh, kind of motto. Just because your subjects are highly technical does not necessarily mean that you are condemned to an austere style. And this is the reason why we have chosen this image and uh, these uh, warm colors here. Give yourself the freedom to inject color, warmth, and emotion in your, into your publications. Today, uh, we know that all players in the research sector, in the research area, do this, use these kind of techniques for your type of subjects too. For example, NGOs, for example, actors from uh, civil society, journalists, etc., or other international organizations. The, the, the first way uh, to do this, uh, we have already mentioned that uh, about the websites, is the use of the visual uh, vocabulary. You have here some examples is extracted from uh, your reports, um, showing buildings, showing end user technologies, for example, or other technologies, which are very impressive and a, a very aesthetic to share with your um, audiences to um, to share uh, emotion warmth and, and, and something more over your uh, 
technology and research. Okay, so um, just to finish up before we um, move on to the, the last round of questions, um, uh, our idea is really to um, incite you to, when you can, introduce the, the human touch and when possible even lightheartedness, even though your subjects are serious, but that does not, not take away from the seriousness of your subjects. Um, so it could be through team portraits, it could be what we call backstage stories or the making of reports. Um, for example, um, I know that um, I'm just thinking of a, a professor from MIT um, a few years ago at a, at a conference here in Paris, and um, he, he, he just created a very funny um, movie um, and the audience was breaking their heart laughing and it was about AI. Okay, it was in the early stages because it was a few, um, it was a few years ago. But it was just whatever way he did it was um, so good because the audience really loved it and uh, it was a way of getting the message across in a in a fun way. And his his point was um, making sure that the objective and the um, instruction you give to your robot is very precise. Otherwise, it could go haywire, and it did because um, the the robot um, seeing hungry children, um, they he he actually looked around in the fridge, couldn't see anything, got the cat and put the cat in the oven. Anyway, that's just uh, one example. So, uh, yeah. so um, we're now <laughs> going to continue on, um, on our round of, uh, of this time. It, it's actually um, recommendations. We wanted to know if any of these recommendations, if they surprised you in any way, um, we would like to just have your reaction. So I'll just go through them briefly. So um, simplify the understanding of your organization. Give the overview of the milestones in your area of activity. Avoid the catalog effect of the year's achievements. Create titles like journalists do. Insert subheadings, introductions, quotes, or keywords. And then on the conveying emotion, use all available space to introduce images, show communities at work, teams, portraits, backstage stories, and making of reports, amongst others. Excuse me. Um, what, what do we answer if none of them surprise us? <laughs> Well, I guess you're a champion.
everybody completed their vote? Okay. So um, we're, um, I guess we're surprised maybe <laughs> at reactions, but the, I'm, I'm sure they're interesting and we'd like to have your, your comments. Um, so visibly the, um, the one that surprised most is uh, avoiding the, the catalog effect. Um, as would, would somebody like to express why? Or not? <laughs> Otherwise, uh, sorry, I just, if you wanted to explain, just, I think that the, it was like the, the gentleman said already that maybe none of them were so surprising. Sure, understand, understand, understand. Um, I guess this is followed then by communities um, at, at work. Um, and then we have uh, simplified the understanding of your organization and create <laughs> titles like journalists do. I choose this uh, last one, create titles like journalists do. I wasn't surprised because uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a valuable thing, but we are not journalists. So... I think it's dangerous to leave a message in few words if these words are not so precise on the communication because the most of the people are people from, uh, of course, uh, scientific or technical uh, um, environment. So I think that there's the need of uh, a professionist to do it. Because of uh, otherwise, uh, uh, you only send this message. Nobody reads the other things, uh, and uh, if you are not right uh, with this message, it's uh, in my opinion, in my in my at least in my professionality, that is not uh, like uh, a journalist. Understand? Um, I understand the precision precision point. I guess our message, our main message, was to incite people, to incite visitors to um, your website, to, to read your reports, inject a bit of catchiness, if you like. It's kind of boosting the attractiveness, uh, um, inciting um, people to, to read further. So, um, but understand that, um, that everybody uh, is not, doesn't have a journalistic mindset. We do not recommend to damage your production. It's perfectly clear. We just, like to share the fact that you can it's a question of balance between precise being precise as a searcher do as scientists uh, do and convince your audiences this is uh, this balance is uh, there is something to play with i think there was somebody else down here who wanted to comment Thank you. Um, it was really interesting. I ticked the box on um, simplifying the understanding of your organization. We, um, we did our website a few years ago and we started off with big discussions about who our target audience was and we sort of were aiming at energy professionals. So they might not be experts in our field, but they kind of know the energy language. So we didn't want to oversimplify it because we're not really aiming at the general public. Thank you, understand. Mm -hmm. I think there was somebody else who wanted to make a comment. So um, I just wanted to say, maybe another way to think about it is, and. I've worked for the federal government in the United States for a long time, so I understand this concept. Sometimes we think that when we post something to a website, we have communicated, um, when in fact, communication is when you get a response and connect with an audience, right? So I understand the limitations of being able to communicate um, highly technical issues um, to an audience, right? Um, but we do have that obligation to do that. We are doing this for a public service, right? So I think that we have to find a way to, um, to make that connection, to not just 
put stuff out there, but also to hear the feedback from the audiences that you're trying to reach. So I maybe just, I am very sympathetic to this idea of communicating like a journalist, right? But I think the, the aim of what's being presented here is to connect with your audience. Um, and so forgive me if I'm not expressing that right, but I think that's what the aim is. And, and if your audience is a technical one, then, then, you know, then it's a technical one, right? But I do think that to a certain extent, um, we do have to think about the grandma because she is paying the taxes for, uh, for the work that we're doing. Thanks. Thank you. That was very clear. Maybe somebody else, we think, put up their hand. Um, it, it's not exactly on this question. Thank you very much for this presentation, but I have a plea. Uh, I unfortunately belong to the part of the population, something like 15%, which face problems with colors and contrast. So they are parts of your slides I just cannot read. So if you can later on avoid to write in white on or in light green on white or in uh, dark pink or red, uh, on black on dark pink on red or things like that, that will help that you cover 100% of the population. And I will be very much happy to understand what you say and what you write. Thank you. Oh, thank you for sharing that with us. We will certainly take that on board. Thank you. So we're now going to maybe jump to the future uh, and we're going to round up with um, a, a, very last, uh, a very last question. Um, so out of, we're, we're, going to, we're going to put up, um, here we go. Uh, so out of the three solutions that would help you most, can you indicate this time in order of priority from one to three? Uh, so this would be um, really helping you most as you go forward in the future uh, with your communications programs. So one, participate in a training session. Two, benefit from external communication expertise. Three, exchange best practices with other TCPs. Thank you.
So if everybody is finished, maybe I'll hand the floor back to Paul to comment and to conclude. Thank you, Carolina, and for uh, for very very clear uh, presentation, very vivid. Um, so I think it was a nice opportunity to to present to you the uh, these recommendations. Uh, I, I feel that uh, all TCPs can benefit from them. Some of them of you may have recognized uh, some of the information, the website pages, etc., that, that were presented. So thank you very much for, for all these TCPs that have participated in the interviews. I think what, what we can take home is uh, a number of things. Uh, for one, as the polls have shown, there's quite a breadth in, in, in the answers on um, what, what is perceived as uh, as your needs and, and how you regard communication, some difficulties, some surprises that you may have had or, or, or not. Um, so it, it's quite a various landscape. That there are no easy single needs uh, that, ha that have shown up. Um, I, I think I very much uh, appreciate the remark made by, by the US delegate on uh, that Communication is connecting with your audience. I think that sums it up quite quite nicely. So thank you for, for that. Um, so, uh, and uh, like I said, I think BCW it, itself had an experience, a rather painful one uh, when it comes to communication because your homework was actually a, a slide deck of 107 pages. So we insisted on on bringing that back to some thirty five, and that was not a difficult, there was not an easy thing to do. It was quite difficult. Uh, so that shows that that communicating, getting the essential information out, is is no easy task, and th that's relative for everyone. Um, so um, it also has been mentioned that that w w we're not journalists, and I think that's very true. So. Today, the audience uh, is you, it is the chairs of, of the TCPs uh, and third members. Uh, and, and I think what is very valid is that, that experts that typically work in your TCPs, they uh, normally in, in their line of work when it comes to publish, publication of scientific articles, they're actually being taken by the hand by, by a journal that is publishing their results and all the work is done for them. So it's, it's really a different, um, it's a different uh, expertise that is needed. So th that's well noted as well. So I think just to conclude, th the big question is how, how to, to go forward. Uh, so I think there's this variety of needs. Uh, some things have come up uh, quite, quite clearly, I think, especially with the latest poll. Uh, so I think there's need for external expertise for, for many of you TCPs. So it's probably something that should be organized within your TCP. Uh, the other thing that came up is also something that's interesting, I think, to the IEA Secretariat, that, that is that uh, TCPs are looking forward to having an exchange on, on best practices, so to continue more or less what we have been doing this afternoon. Um, I don't know, we have discussing a little bit with the Secretariat how to follow up. I, I think uh, we'll think it over, we'll think what has been set and exchanged this afternoon. Um, but it could be that we'll get back to you soon, probably before the end of the year, uh, probably with some kind of questionnaire to, to get a, a better idea of what, what your needs are, if you wanted to improve your communication. Um, and then based on that, we could probably come back to you early 2024 with some concrete propositions. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you very much, Paul, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I hope that uh, we all learned a little bit uh, today, or maybe a lot. Uh, and as you said, Paul, a lot of uh, food for thought and to think about as we think through uh, how to incorporate this into next steps. Uh, one last session uh, before we close, I'm going to hand it over uh, to Per, who is going to provide a short summary of uh, what we heard amongst the various uh, breakout groups in the first session earlier this afternoon. Thank you very much, Amanda, and thanks, of course, all to all the participants, uh, including the, the moderators and the note takers uh, for, for conducting this exercise. Uh, and I take it that uh, since no one was here for the coffee break, you had a 
in time. You had a good discussions and uh, also passing by the rooms, uh, outside of the rooms, I heard uh, were quite active discussions as well. So I really hope from our side, uh, on behalf of, from our side, that you really uh, found this as a useful exercise. And as we said, this is uh, a starting point in many ways uh, for trying to dig a bit deeper into what we could be doing uh, from a, of course, from a government point of view, uh, you delegates from certain working parties, but also from TCP sides, what are the potential improvements to make in the, how you communicate for the annual briefings? And uh, of course, uh, what's the wish list to the IE Secretariat for also helping to support uh, communication ac across the network? And then also, of course, thanks to the, the colleagues here for doing this uh, last exercise, which of course is also part of this uh, broader conversation of how to improve uh, communication, building upon uh, the, the feedback we re received through the, the CERT review. Just in very uh, short summary, and we go through the details and debrief with some of the colleagues uh, that took the notes uh, to make sure we don't any miss any good inputs and details. But just in a quick sim summary uh, on when it comes to the, the role of the CERT uh, working parties, basically our government officials, um, seems to be a, a, a quite a strong support and recognition that there will be a value uh, to have uh, national TCP days uh, on a more frequent basis in countries, uh, but also in identifying national TCP coordinators to continue building that ownership of uh, the TCPs, uh, ensuring that there are alignments with government's priorities. Also, uh, there is a wish uh, for clear guidance from CERT to the TCPs, uh, and we have that discussion tomorrow as well as part of the request for extension uh, process. We're also part of the CERT review. We are. Uh, there are discussions or had been discussions of uh, clearer guidance uh, to the TCPs for those pro for that process. Uh, so certainly is something that being uh, in motion. But again, here the working parties uh, will play a role as well because CERT cannot in itself be active uh, in 39 TCPs. However, on that note, uh, I also see in some comments that many TCPs, and we heard it's also in the past from the CERT delegates uh, to open up the TCPs uh, exco meetings uh, activities for CERT delegates that are interested. Uh, there was one idea of um, uh, not saying that, that CERT delegates should adopt the TCP, but this of also find a way to maybe if there's an interest from CERT delegates to also uh, follow individual TCPs uh, uh, to ensure that the, the gap between the, 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 the delegates of CERT and the TCPs are closed. Uh, when it comes further to the the discussion about uh, what the TCP can be doing, of course, that's very linked back to the annual reporting uh, and what's uh, the format of that. And I think we have, uh, again, I got a few more reactions, both from the CERT delegates that want to see a bit more policy-oriented, policy briefs, uh, achievements, uh, who were behind, who were to part of the activities uh, or were behind the achievements. Uh, and... Uh, to make sure that this is a document that in the end of the day is actually read. Uh, so I think this is something we would certainly take note of and we'll use the next month to, to think and work together with you how this can be further improved. Uh, then it comes to the IA side. I think you mentioned it too, to Paul, um, the role of us to continue facilitating uh, between TCPs on best practices. Uh, not so much, of course, on, on substance, but on, on, on operation of the TCPs, where communication is one, one side, but also we hear that there are other topics where TCPs, even if working on very different topics, can still have a value of, of working, sharing best practices if it's on how to administer, how to, as was said by the, the WIND TCP this morning as well, how do you, as you're growing, how do you manage to also, uh, how do you manage that growth uh, to sustain it as well uh, with all the additional work with the limited resources. Again, something to think more about how we can operate, uh, of course. We, what we also heard from, I saw in some of the comments is this idea of, yes, there is a need for, and I saw also that in the, the final slide here uh, for uh, continued advice from uh, experts on communication. Um, we, one of the questions uh, when we asked what TCPs uh, were missing, sometimes in your network as well, as linked to the, if we, this idea of uh, the peer review groups that can help with the request for extension process, Communication was mentioned with quite a few of you that this is one area where you don't have the expertise in the network and that could also be brought in. So something to take note of as well. Uh, the last thing uh, to say, or well, two more things, uh, and I know this is coming up also in many of the input to us where UTCPs think we should prioritize more is this 
how to facilitate better communication between the TCPs. Uh, the delegates have been mentioned as one potential tool, but we also see in some of the proposals here to uh, go even further uh, and how to share uh, contacts, how to monitor exactly what's happening in e at each TCP work stream level, annex le or task level. And these things is something to think about as well to ensure that we reduce barriers between the TCPs to work. Uh, but again, something on our, uh, which we take note of before as well. And yes, finally, which I think is a very good comment uh, in this, this soup of acronyms, how can I ensure that any newcomers uh, are not discouraged for entering into this, this community uh, and easy poly, well, easy briefing material for, and that goes the same with the CERT uh, colleagues as well. But also here, if you have any newcomers to the TCP networks, is there anything that we can put together, one or two, three pages that could easily explain uh, what this is about, what it's trying to achieve, et cetera. I think that's something which uh, I think we can also consider. But again, uh, there's no decisions here today. It's just uh, we really appreciate all the input and ideas. That was the purpose for this session. And now we continue, uh, regroup, and we'll come back to you as well, but seeking uh, together with the CERT uh, delegates, um, uh, preparing for a CERT meeting in March uh, to come up with a first or next step of some of these ideas to actually be put into practice. Thank you very much again, and back to you, Chair. Thanks very much, Pear, and uh, thanks uh, to all of you for your excellent uh, participation through the day. I think it's uh, a positive sign when we can come out of these discussions with a very long list of things to consider. It means that people uh, participated in the discussions and had lots of thoughts, uh, which is better than the alternative. Uh, I continue to be struck by the diversity uh, among the TCPs uh, in this room and otherwise, uh, both in terms of the subjects that you cover, uh, the level of granularity uh, with which you cover them and, and the organization um, that you use to undertake your work. So I hope that uh, it's been beneficial here on the first day for us to continue to learn uh, from each other. Before we wrap up, I'm gonna hand it over to Timur for a few parting words. Thank you, Amanda. I don't want to... Um say too many things other than big thanks to all of you for the active uh, participation today. I hope it was uh, useful for you, both um, the input we just got from um, our um, external um, colleagues um, on the communication side of things, big thanks from, from my and certainly from the secretariats and um, for, uh, for the contribution here, but also with a view to the exchanges we had. Um, uh, I personally found it extremely useful, um, not only with regards to the themes that we were covering, but I also learned a lot from Brian about the history of the um, EDSAP TCP to Keith, uh, the number of summer schools that they have been hosting, or um, from Stefan in the break you know, over um, wind supply chains. So uh, I think that's the key value here, um, that uh, we have an opportunity to um, meet others, uh, talk about um, things that we are experiencing in our day-to-day type of work, um, how it compares with um, the work of others. Um, so for us as an agency, it was very useful to discuss with you today. I hope you find it among yourselves um, as useful and uh, also the opportunity to exchange with the third colleagues. Uh, we will have a formal uh, or we will have a reception, not so formal, I think, uh, a reception uh, tonight. <laughs> so no, no, <laughs> I'll take off the tie then. <laughs> so uh, to emphasize the informality. Um, but uh, yeah, we are looking forward to further discussions there and of course to tomorrow. So back to you, Amanda. Thank you. So uh, for those of you here in the room uh, and with apologies to those of you online, uh, the reception is going to be in the IEA cafe, which is just outside the door and to your right uh, at the end of the hall. Just a few things to remember uh, for tomorrow. So we're back here in this room or downstairs in this room again uh, for day two tomorrow. Same timing, so uh, coffee networking starting at 9 a.m. Uh, with the session kicking off here in the room promptly at 9.30. Uh, tomorrow we're going to uh, dig in a little bit deeper to the notion of uh, TCP coordination groups, uh, to the request for extension process, and we'll also have uh, a special address by uh, Dr. Biral, the executive director of the IEA. A reminder for those of you here to please keep your badge uh, so you can get back into this building tomorrow. And uh, I'll see you at the reception. Thank you to those of you online. Have a good evening. Thanks for an excellent day.